audiobook narrator Mike Scott. When selecting your next audiobook, choose from some of the great titles narrated by audiobook narrator Mike Scott, like Bloody Autumn, the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1864. And if you're an author or publisher interested in having your written works produced as audiobooks, give Mike a shout at MikeScottVoice.com. Mike Scott, the voice of history. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. It is warm in here tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Very warm, but a beautiful day today here in Gettysburg. Hello, everybody watching us live on Facebook. You are the lucky ones. You are the lucky ones. Uh, We have uh, a full house in here, and the body heat is going to make it just excruciating. You know, Veronica, you could open a window there if you want to do that, too. Uh-huh. Well, that's what's making it so hot. Yeah. And that's why we put you by the window. <laughs> um, <laughs> we got uh, our buddy Veronica Brestensky in here, Esquire, the right honorable uh, attorney at law. And we got uh, old Six Questions Lent sitting over there in the corner. How you doing there, Six Questions? Uh, alive? <laughs> You not you didn't get hurt today? Nothing? Oh no, no. But there's the day is young. Yes, you're not home yet, and even then you're not safe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, poor Mike. Um, all right, today, ladies and gentlemen, we are talking about June 26th, 1863. Not June 26th is coming up, but June 26th in 1863. Um, which was uh, quite an exciting day for the people who lived in Gettysburg. Before we get to that, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, which you watching us on Facebook are already doing. Probably. But get those uh, notification bells uh, clicked there. Also, Instagram and YouTube, same thing. YouTube, start moving over to YouTube, ladies and gentlemen. Start moving over there. We're eventually going to just be moving over to YouTube. Uh, and make sure that you have your notifications turned on in all those places. Also, if you use the Apple Podcast app, please leave a five-star review. Reviews, liking, sharing, and subscribing are the best ways to help us grow our audience. Who else could we have gotten to talk about uh, June 26th than the man who is with us today, who is staring me down saying, <laughs> why have you not acknowledged me yet? <laughs> and But we're going to do it right now. Tim Smith, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> Oh, I'm glad to be here. Hey, Tim. <laughs> um, this uh, June 26th is, was quite an exciting day, and a lot of people who uh, you know, are new to studying the battle or something like that might not realize that it didn't just materialize on July 1st. Well, I think um, a lot of visitors, when they come to Gettysburg, don't realize that the Southern Army actually passed through the town prior to the battle. Right. So the Friday prior to the battle, June 26, 1863, a portion of the Southern Army marched through the town of Gettysburg on their way east to York and, of course, the Susquehanna River. So, um, you know, sometimes when you tell them that, uh, they're like, well, how come they didn't get to high ground on Little Round Top first then? <laughs> right. You know, so, but... Um, uh, it is fascinating. Well, why, Tim? Why yeah, didn't they? Good, good question. Because they didn't question. care, right? They were moving on to York. Yeah. yeah. They had other bigger fish to fry at that moment. Gettysburg is important to us today, but it wasn't that important back then. Yeah. The other reason June 26 doesn't get a lot of attention is because it's uh, uh, the Confederate Army fighting against uh, Pennsylvania militiamen, and mm-hmm. there are virtually... Uh, no casualties. And I say that there are very few casualties. So uh, we don't have um, uh, like heavy losses of the participants involved. And so, uh, you know, it kind of gets uh, passed over. But in the, uh, you know, for the outcome of the campaign, it's, it's a kind of interesting story. So uh, today we'll talk about the battle that, or the skirmishes around Gettysburg on June 26th and the Confederate Army marching through this area. And we'll also do some setup and talk about the different people that were involved in uh, action on June 26th. Yeah, uh, the 26th is an interesting day. When I had to write uh, the narrative, the second narrative episode, I, I spent a lot of time on that. And I, was, I really liked learning about it because mm-hmm. there's a lot of stuff that went on. Yeah. A lot of interesting it's a, it's things. It's a busy, busy, busy day. Yeah. So why don't we start the day? What okay. happens uh, in the morning? Where are we in the morning? Okay. Well, we, um, we have a little um, presentation here. We do have here. a presentation. And um, we'll, we'll, uh, do you want to start? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, of course, on the screen we have um, Richard Yule. And uh, he is in charge of the advance of the Southern Army into Pennsylvania in June of 1863. And uh, we go to the next one. Um, On June 15th, advanced elements of the Southern Army 
a cavalry command under Albert Jenkins captured Chambersburg about midnight uh, on uh, June 15th. Think about this. It's not until June 30th that Buford's cavalry arrives in Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. So for a full two weeks, the Southern Army is in Pennsylvania, Mm. marching back and forth across the countryside, gathering supplies and provisions, and skirmishing with uh, the Pennsylvania militia that are raised for the uh, the occasion of the invasion. So it's fascinating in that respect. Let's go to the next one. Um, When Governor Curtin realizes that this is a serious invasion. Um, He calls for emergency troops to come to Harrisburg and to organize into regiments that then will help repel the invaders. Mm -hmm. Um, He's met with a lukewarm reception at first. And there are many reasons for that. I I think it's easy for uh, historians of the battle who were used to writing about units, battle-hardened veterans of the Army of the Potomac, to um, critis- be critical of these uh, Pennsylvania citizens for not rising up in force. But a lot of them believed that this was just a, a ploy by the federal government to get them in- to join the Army. Ah. And once they were in the Army, it wouldn't be so easy to get out of the <clears throat> Army. And uh, uh, the other thing was that Governor Curtin would like troops to come to Harrisburg to defend Harrisburg. Mm, mm. So we take all the people here that could possibly be defending the homes and firesides of their loved ones, and we send them all to Harrisburg. Uh, This area might get captured and, Mm. you know, um, there might be a lot of, you know, uh, confiscation of your local farm goods, but Harrisburg will be protected. Right. You can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs, Tim. Yes. So um, <laughs> it is tough to raise the militiamen at first. And then also the federal government didn't want Pennsylvania to raise a militia because they wanted men to join the army and be sent into areas where they thought that they should be sent. Right. There was Since the outbreak of the war, there was a fundamental conflict between the state of Pennsylvania wanting to have troops guarding the border of Pennsylvania and the federal government wanting Pennsylvania troops to join the army, put down the rebellion, and then once the rebellion was ended, there would be no threat of invasion in right. Pennsylvania. That makes sense. And uh, this all culminates in the Gettysburg campaign when they have trouble raising troops right away. So um, if we go to the next uh, slide, this is uh, Captain um, Frederick Kleinfelter. And um, he is actually a graduate of Gettysburg College and a uh, student at the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Gettysburg. And he is part of a group of young men who gather together at the call of Governor Carton. And I think on the 16th, June 16th, they gather together and they organize men that then are sent to Harrisburg. And uh, there are about 60 guys in the unit from uh, Gettysburg College, kids, you know, uh, young men, we like to call them. Mm -hmm. And uh, (laughs) there's uh, four students of the Lutheran Seminary. There's a few local Gettysburg residents Mm -hmm. and then other uh, a few more men will be put into the unit when you get to Harrisburg. But they go to Harrisburg and they um, enlist in the emergency regiment. They end up being Company A of the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Regiment, also known as the College Guards, because a large amount of them are uh, from Gettysburg College. Right. This photograph I purchased myself at a um, local uh, Gettysburg um, relic store. Uh, I would say maybe in the 1990s I got it, maybe in 1980s. And uh, it was an 1862 Gettysburg College album. And, of course, I knew that he was going to be in that album. Uh So um, uh, Frederick Kleinfelter. And so he would be elected as the captain of uh, the Gettysburg Company. Okay, Company A. Yeah. And uh, so they're organized in Harrisburg. They're uh, armed. They're uh, equipped, given uniforms, and then um, they'll be the uh, first of the regiments to be sent out to confront the uh, Confederates. 
When, when they're back here, before they actually go up to Harrisburg, um, where do they organize? Where do they? Um, well, there's two accounts of their organization, and both of them say it occurred on Chambersburg Street. Okay. One of them, one of it, one of the articles has the inception at um, Alexander Beeler's bookstore. Okay, which, which was is on where? the first block of Chambersburg Street, just a little west of the square on the north side. What is it today? Is it a house or a um, business? Yeah, it's been torn down. It's it's uh. um. Uh, it's next to um, Mama Venturas. Okay. And then uh, just down the street, there's Huber's Drug Store. And another account says it occurred at that store where they gathered together. So somewhere in the first block of Chambersburg Street, they read, they probably read the telegraph notice that's been placed on a board in front of the Star and Banner office, which is also on the first block of Chambersburg Street to get their information. So they organize and then they go to Harrisburg and are put into this uh, company. Let's go to the next slide. Well, okay, there, I got it. It's um, the colonel of the unit uh, as organized is Colonel William Wesley Jennings. Now he was formally the colonel of the 127th Pennsylvania Infantry, and he was a combat veteran. Uh, he was at the Battle of uh, Fredericksburg and at the Battle of Chancellorsville. And uh, for those of you not familiar with it, the 127th Pennsylvania was one of the units that was just discharged in May of 1863 from okay. the Army of the Potomac. And he's a native of ha Harrisburg. And so he's in Harrisburg, and Governor Curtin asked him if he would take control of this uh, Pennsylvania Emergency Regiment. How many, how many emergency regiments did they there's raise? There's quite a number that are raised. Okay. And um, From this area, we just have the 26th? Yeah, we just have Company A. Or just Company the 20th, A. And then we just know what uh, we're talking about. But they, the companies arrive in Harrisburg and then are organized. Okay. And uh, at first, uh, like I said, they have trouble organizing the men into units. And some men travel to Harrisburg and then actually leave Harrisburg because they're not happy with the... Um, the uncertainty of the time of service. <laughs> okay. You know, and again, a lot of them think they're being tricked into joining the army and then they're going to be in for two or three right, years and they right. don't want that. It, was that happening a lot? Where did they get this idea? Um, uh, I, I think they get the idea because they're being mustered into federal service okay. and, and, you know, um, uh, they hear stories. Okay. I don't know if it's necessarily true, but there are units that there are times where people believe they are signing up for one thing, and then when the paper is put in front of them that they sign their enlistment papers, it says for two years or three years. A good example of this uh, that everybody knows about is the Second Main Infantry. Remember, most of the Second Main was discharged from service prior to the mm -hmm, Battle of Gettysburg. Mm -hmm, at the same time, the 127th, about the same time they're discharged. But some of the men had accidentally signed up for three years instead of two years, and they end up being... How'd you accidentally do that, though? Well, maybe they didn't accidentally do it, but they were felt they tricked like they were doing it. Yeah, they felt like their unit was discharged and they should be going home with the unit. Right. Okay. And then I said whole scene in the yeah, Killer Angels yeah. about that. And I think an incident actually occurs in May, and in the movie they have. Yeah, the movie is a lot closer to the, the battle. Day before the battle, I think it was like six weeks they were with the 20th Maine. Okay, so it was a good amount of time. But uh, this um, this colonel has battle experience. So he's the only one. No. <laughs> okay. Let's go to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to mention that although uh, there's a lot of young men in the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Regiment and a lot of older men, you know, these are men who are not in the Army or, um, you know, are coming, some of them served in other units. But uh, by and large, the rank and file are um, inexperienced, but the officers have much experience. Um, Lieutenant Colonel <clears throat> uh, from Hanover, Pennsylvania, uh, Joseph Jenkins, I believe he actually is killed commanding a unit in 1864, and uh, the Hanover GAR, I believe, is named after him. And Major Lorenzo Gran Greenewalt, uh, he, I think he was also in the 127th um, at a, um, um, but uh, Jenkins was uh, in a unit 
I believe he's, he attacked a sunken lane in Antietam in the 130th off the top of my head. Okay. And then, um, of course, I put here a list of the officers of the companies. Company A, of course, from Gettysburg, Adams County. And you can see Company B from Bradford County, Company C from Clinton County, Company D from Dolphin County, Company E from Lebanon County. I'd like to point out that in Company A, the second lieutenant is Luther Slater of Loudoun County, Virginia. He was actually in a Northern Virginia unit, hmm. and it was called um, the Loudoun County Rangers. Oh, yeah. And uh, during the second Manassas campaign, uh, a Confederate cavalry detachment from Loudoun County made a move around the Union lines and attacked the Loudoun Rangers at a place called Waterford. And... Um, uh, Luther Slater was at this battle, and he was severely wounded. And it was basically guys from the same town, some from the Northern Army and some from the Southern Army, fighting against each other. Hmm. And there's a plaque at this uh, church where they surround the Loudoun County Rangers, the Confederates. The Loudoun County Rangers are cavalry? And they're a Northern Cavalry and, unit and he was from Northern wounded? Virginia. He was, he was severely, severely wounded. wounded. So his parents... Interesting to him, because I thought cavalry didn't really get hurt. Oh, very good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he said, "Cool, <laughs> <laughs> very good." Go ahead. <laughs> His parents send him to Gettysburg okay. to recover, and so here he is. He's uh, recovering. Oh, and I should tell <laughs> and then you, this battle's coming his way. Yeah, and I should tell you, at the Battle of Waterford in eighteen, I think it's in August of eighteen sixty-two. Uh -huh. um, the unit that attacked the Loudoun County Rangers was Elijah White's. 35th Virginia oh, Battalion of Cavalry. Okay, all right. And some of the men at the unit had brothers and relatives in the northern unit. So here he joins this unit. He goes to Harrisburg. He becomes an officer because he has military experience. They're sent back to Gettysburg. And on June 26, he's sent out to Marsh Creek. And guess who comes down the road and captures him? White. The same guys. Elijah White's 35th Battalion mm, of Cavalry. The Comanches. Now, he also, I should mention, Luther Slater, falls in love with a girl named Yount. Who hasn't? Who, yeah, Yount, yeah. <laughs> she, she, her father owns the hotel, the Washington Hotel, just uh, where the uh, Lincoln Diner is. Oh, okay. And um, he ends up marrying her. Oh. But he survives. Okay, so if we go down the list, let's go to the next page. Um, you can see uh, Company F from Montgomery County. Um, I, I uh, like Homie County. I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, in uh, Montgomery County unit is um, uh, Pennypacker, Samuel Pennypacker, mm -hmm. who later becomes the governor mm -hmm. of Pennsylvania. And then um, Company I is from Hanover. Okay. And the captain's John Summerfield Forrest. And the first lieutenant is John Quincy Adams Peffer <laughs> from New Oxford. You almost had me, and then you said Peffer, and yeah. you lost me. <laughs> John Quincy Adams Peffer. <laughs> and so about uh, a dozen men in Company I are actually from New Oxford, Pennsylvania. Okay. So we have another, uh, it's kind of a local unit. Now you might look at the bottom of this. I created this uh, um, list and my source for it is there's a roster of the company officers of the 26th um, at the state archives. And so I actually went through some of the rosters of these units at the State Archives. I'm not going to get into too, too much more detail about that now. Okay. But um, here's a picture. Let's go to the next one. Here's a picture of Henry Wirt Shriver of Company I, 26 Pennsylvania Emergency Regiment. Now, he's related to the Wirts of Hanover, but he's Henry Wirt Shriver. And, of course, he lives in Union Mills, Maryland. Okay. Where Jeb Stewart spends a night on... Um, was that a June 29th and the Union Army Fifth Corps spends the night there on June 30th. So um, uh, the reason I put this in here, because this is a photograph of Henry Ward Shriver in uniform. We do not know that he served in another Civil War unit. This is the only known image hmm. of a soldier wearing the uniform of the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Regiment. Okay. The other right. guys we have photographs of in this unit. But not in uniform. Served in other, no, they're in uniform, oh, oh, okay. but they were in other units. Oh, gotcha. All right. And so their uniform is probably from their other unit. 
But here's a guy in the uniform of the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Regiment. Oh, that's interesting. Altogether, I guess there were about 100. There were about 740 of these men uh, in the 26th. That's a pretty decent sized uh, it's a pretty good regiment. regiment yeah. Yes. But how? What was their metal? How? What was the quality? Well, that's that's going to be another <laughs> issue. <laughs> so now let's go to the next slide. Another character that's involved in June 26 is Captain Robert Bell of the oh, Adams yes. County Cavalry. Big bad Bell. He later became major of the 21st Pennsylvania Cavalry. Robert Bell um, had been in a local cavalry militia unit since the beginning of the war. They organized in 1861 under the term the Adams Dragoons, and they were commanded by a captain out of Fairfield, a guy named Hill McCreary. In 1862, during the Antietam campaign, they formed again. And uh, at the outbreak of the Gettysburg campaign, um, Captain Robert Bell decided to go around. He talked to some of the guys who had been in the 1862 sort of militia unit. And he got on a train and he rode to Harrisburg and met with Governor Curtin and said, I have a... uh, a, you know, a unit of um, cavalrymen to supply our own horses, and um, we're ready to enlist. And Governor Curtin thought about it for a little while, and he said, you know what? Stay in Gettysburg, hmm. and I'll send an officer to you. I want you to act as scouts in that area at the advance of the Southerners and, and feed information to me um, about their uh, activities. Okay. There's a telegraph in Gettysburg, and the telegraph line runs along the rail, railroad line to Hanover and Hanover Junction and up to York and, you know, over to York and to Harrisburg. So they can get telegraphic messages of the day-to-day um, situation from Gettysburg, and they can have this group of scouts out there. So they didn't have uniforms during the Gettysburg campaign, and they were only known as the Adams County Cavalry. Hmm. Now, after the campaign's over— Then they end up being in Columbia, Pennsylvania, and at the end of July, the men are enlisted into the 21st Pennsylvania Cavalry. And so a lot of people say the 21st Pennsylvania Cavalry is here, and they have a monument on the battlefield, and it's a monument to one of their members was killed on June 26th. Right. But these guys don't belong to the 21st Pennsylvania Cavalry, don't even know about it. Right. That's a future unit that they are not in at the time. And there's so, about so uh, the, uh, there's two monuments to the 21st PA, isn't yeah. there? Mm-hmm. And one is what? What's why are there two? And they're well, close there's two, together. One of them is a regimental monument uh-huh. that honors the fact that one of their companies was involved in the. Um, and, 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 and is that action. referring to Bell's? Yes. Okay, so even though it it was that it was one of their companies, but later it was one of their companies. Yeah, it's right. very confusing. Yes. I so, don't think they should have a monument on the battlefield. Right, because they weren't here. They were but not here. A future yeah. element of that <laughs> regiment was here. Which, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. But then they also have a monument to George Sando, who George was killed Sando. on June 26th, okay. and who was never a member of the 21st Pennsylvania Cavalry. Do tell. Because he was killed before they were. Oh, oh yes, of course. That makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was more of a... You thought it was going to be something I thought there dramatic. was something... Yeah, sorry. Down, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, it's the heat getting me down. Yeah. By the way, Mike, uh, would you take this rag and dab my forehead every once in a while, please? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, go ahead. So he's going to play a role in this action. Then we have... Let's go to the next slide. It should be Major Granville O. Howler. Mm. And I think I could write a book about this guy. Let's see. And, oh, I should tell you, to preface this, you know, I'm showing some photographs here. And do we have the Granville O'Howler slide up? I'm showing some photographs here from my um, private collection. This photograph is actually from the Adams County Historical Society. It is the only known Civil War image of him. I made a mistake a few years ago, probably about 20 years ago, Um Carlisle, United States Army Military History Institute, had this um, just phenomenal guy that worked in their photographic research library. And he knew all the Civil War dealers and collectors, and he was making a a collection at Carlisle of known images of Civil War soldiers. Mm -hmm. And so I took him all the Adams County Historical Society photographs up there and allowed them to be copied. And while he worked up there, um, you know, they would, people would 
look at the photographers and credit them to the Adams County Historical Society. I thought it was kind of cool. And he would actually even have them call us and ask permission to use them. Well, the Army, he retired, and the Army changed their policy and just made them public to everybody. And so now people use this <laughs> photograph, and it's been used again and again and again, and it's not credited <laughs> properly to us. Oh, man. But we have the original image in our, our archives. So let me tell you about this guy, Major Granville Owen Howler. He's born in York, Pennsylvania in 1819. Mm. Um, he... Uh, attended uh, York Public Schools and went to the York County Academy. In 1839, um, he applied uh, to the United States Military Academy at West Point. But instead, he was invited to Washington, D.C. He was interviewed and immediately commissioned into the United States Army as a second lieutenant in the 4th United States Infantry. Um, he served at Fort Gibson. Um, was involved in some fighting against the Cherokee. Uh, in 1841, his unit was sent to Florida, where he was involved in several skirmishes during the Seminole War. He was subsequently stationed at Jefferson Barracks, kind of like Lewis Armistead, mm -hmm. and then Louisiana and along the Texas border with Mexico. Um, in 1846, he served under Zachary Taylor at the opening of the Mexican War and um, was in the Army of Occupation uh, in 1847, um, he commanded a company in the 4th United States Infantry and was on the march with Winfield Scott from Veracruz to Mexico City. Cool. So he's a pretty serious... So he's been in a lot of uh, stuff, yeah. ...battle-hardened veteran. According to an 1863 biography of him, Major Howler is a high-toned gentleman of the old school of Army officer. He serves as a lieutenant at the battles of Palo Alto, Monterey, Veracruz, Cerro Gorda, Cherubusco. I don't. I never say that right. <laughs> El Monterey de Rey, El Molina de Rey. Uh, he was in the storming party at Mexico City, and in each of his engagements, he is honorably mentioned by name for his bravery, skill, and military character. He was a companion in arms and a messmate with. General Ulysses S. Grant. Oh. Now, this is written in 1863. Huh. So, you know, a little before Grant becomes right. Famous. Right, right. Yeah. And um, uh, one of his major accidents, he was he received a promotion because of his actions, Chapultepec. Okay. So he led to the charge at Mexico City. Um, in 1861, uh, he was in New Mexico Terry. He was at Fort Mojave in the New Mexico Territory. He arrived in Washington, D.C., was assigned to the Army of the Potomac. Uh, he was the Inspector General of the Provost Marshal General's Department. Um, he actually was assigned to the Army of the Potomac and was in charge of the headquarters staff of McClellan's Army. Hmm. So he was very good friends with George Brenton McClellan. And... Um, he uh, is an ardent supporter of McClellan, and he was devastated when McClellan was relieved of command. As a matter of fact, after Burnside took over and we had the debacle at Fredericksburg, he got a little bit too drunk l late one, one night, and he was bad-mouthing Abraham Lincoln and the mm -hmm. authorities in Washington for their dereliction of duty at releasing the great... Uh, you know, McClellan, uh, McClellan from yeah. command. There's a neat quote I, I found about one article. I wonder if I put it in here. Um, let's see. Uh, January 1863 article remarked that he was proverbial, proverbial <laughs> in the Army as an authority upon all disputed points of tactics. <laughs> So, you know, he, he likes to talk he, military yeah, tactics. Yeah. So anyway, this getting drunk and bad-mouthing Abraham Lincoln in front of other people actually got him into trouble. They reported him, and um, the justice was slow in catching up with him. But in uh, the summer of 1863, he would be relieved of command. In the summer or December? Um, in the summer. In the summer. In the summer. So okay. after the Battle of so Gettysburg. It didn't catch up to him yeah. without, until after the battle. <laughs> and I should mention that some um, uh, writers have insinuated that he was released from command of the Army because of his performance on June 26th. 
Oh. And this has it had mm, absolutely nothing, to do, nothing to do with that. What is his job on June 26th? So he um, he he is uh, leaves the army after Chancellorsville. He's sick, and he's in Harrisburg, or he's in York at the time of the Gettysburg campaign. So uh, Darius Couch is named the commander of a newly formed department of the Susquehanna on June 11th. He makes his way to Harrisburg, and he offers his, his services to Darius Couch, mm -hmm. who he knew from the Army of the Potomac, or Darius Couch. <laughs> no, Darius Couch. And uh, Of Couch's brigade. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> Couch <laughs> makes him an aide-de-camp and says, I have a job for you. So he sends him to Gettysburg. Uh -huh. Now, he first rides to the Riceville Bridge. He, he um, organizes the defenses there, sur surveys the situation, rides to York, his hometown. He gives a big speech, and he talks about how he's going to organize the troops there. Mm -hmm. And then he comes to Gettysburg, and he tries to organize the um, people of the town to action. And um, he's the one who uh, musters Adams County Cavalry, Robert Bell's Adams County Cavalry, into uh, federal service. Okay, so, so he's kind of coming down as, like, Couch's representative? Yes, and, kind and of he's going to be in charge of the military situation okay. in Gettysburg on June 26th. Okay. That's why he's so important. All right. Now, he also calls a courthouse, a meeting at the Adams County Courthouse on June 20th. And according to J. Hard Word, you know, they ring the courthouse bell and people come. And then he makes a big speech and he wants everyone, every all males, to enlist in some sort of unit, whether it be the Adams County Cavalry or just uh, gathering guns together and uh, or having older men gather axes and are going to fell some trees in the passes or uh, act as bushwhackers. He's just trying to arm everyone mm. and he gives a big speech about it. Now, the next slide is that uh, I think it's David McConaughey. Is the guy with the crack on the photograph? OK, yeah. David McConaughey, a Gettysburg attorney, as Veronica might know. <laughs> and uh, um, he actually. Uh, organizes a group of men that will be involved in the action around June 1863. Um, I should point out that uh, June 26th, his wife gives birth to a child. And he's out galvaning around the countryside, gathering information for the Union cause. Wow. David. Yeah. So he's the leader. How old is he? Of scouts. Well, good question. I don't think I have his date of birth he, here. He, I mean, is this a... He's a little older. But he's is probably this, 50. He's 50. And his, his I, wife I, had a baby. Well, maybe he's 40. Good, good for him. Can't remember that off the top oh, of my head. Still, good for is. him. But David McConaughey uh, is uh, fascinating in the respects that he gets a bunch of older men from town uh -huh. to disguise themselves as older men. <laughs> <laughs> and then they <laughs> ride on horses or sneak <laughs> Out across the countryside, yeah. and you gather information about the Southern Army. Okay. And then he brings that information back, goes to the telegraph office, and he telegraphs Governor Curtin dispatches from, you know, his scouts. Okay. And he has some very good reports about the whereabouts of the Southern Army in a situation when, you know, that information was desperately uh, sought in Harrisburg. Got it. And, um, you know, there is a group of records at the state archives, incoming telegraphs to the governor's office. Mm -hmm. And when I found that, I was, I was in heaven. Like a kid in a candy yeah. store. Telegraphs, every telegraph that came into the office, they recorded and they, then they put it in this file. And you could look through all the dispatches. And I found a lot of David McConaughey dispatches on the activities of the Confederate Army leading up to June 26th. Did you find any interest, anything interesting that maybe never made it into the Absolutely. history books? Absolutely. What'd you find? Well, I think the, 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 the thing that people, um, uh, that people have credited me, uh, credited from my discovering it more than any other thing was David Wills sent a telegraph from Gettysburg to Governor Curtin saying that, hey, we have a group of colored residents that have formed their own company mm. and would like to be 
uh, a militia unit here during a call for emergency troops. And then Governor Curtin telegraphs back, no, we, we're not having uh, black soldiers in the emergency regiments, I'm sorry, and turns them down. What was the guy's name that was the like the leader of that Owen group? Robinson. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Upton, it's Randolph Johnson. Randolph Johnson. Rand yeah. jo Randolph yes. Johnson. So uh, I think people, I, I brought that to people's attention, and that's gotten a lot of publicity from this. But there's lots of other great stuff I haven't really shared uh, that comes out of the June 26 telegraphs or the June telegraphs. So, um, uh, and, it, and it just makes the, uh, gives you more detail of the picture that you can't get. Mm -hmm. I should just mention one more thing about David McConaughey. On June 28th, two days after Juba Early passes through uh, the town, uh, Joseph Copeland and his Michigan Cavalry Brigade enters Gettysburg, and they are trying to gather information about the Confederate Army. And David McConaughey says, yes, they passed through two days ago. He tells them how many men they had passing through based upon how many flags, regimental flags he saw them carry, how many pieces of artillery. And also, he has information about the other Confederate column that passed north of the town. And then Copeland rides back to Emmitsburg, sends this message to General Meade. Of course, when Copeland gets beyond Emmitsburg, he finds out that he's been relieved of duty, mm. and eventually George Armstrong Custer will be made the um, general in charge of the Michigan Cavalry Brigade. The hero of Gettysburg. Yeah. But I think it's on June 29th that General Meade sends a personal note to David McConaughey thanking him for his service as a scout and giving information to the army. So um, he's credited with that, you know, that distinction. Right. Okay, let's go to the next one. Another person, and you're probably surprised by all these people you've never heard of that are involved in the June 26 action. This is uh, Samuel Randall, Captain Samuel Randall, a United States oh, congressman. Yes. And he is in charge of a group of men known as the First Troop of Philadelphia City Cavalry. <laughs> so Samuel Randall, um, I should say that the First City Troop are a group of men from Philadelphia that uh, are volunteers. They're not mustered in the federal service. Mm. Um, they, the, the inception of the unit is from the American Revolution. And they formed, you know, they, they say part of George Washington's bodyguard. And the, the first troop of Philadelphia City Cavalry still exists. Of course, they have tanks now. <laughs> but uh, they have a museum. They have an archives. There's lots of information. Um, Samuel Randall leaves Washington, D.C. The first city troop go to Harrisburg, and he meets them in Harrisburg. Uh, and they come by train from Philadelphia. They bring their horses with them on the train. Um, when they get to Harrisburg, Governor Curtin says, great, we're going to muster in the federal service. And they say, no, we're volunteers. We're not here to be mustered in the federal service. Um, they get criticized a little bit, uh, especially at the Battle of um, uh, Wrightsville, because they um, ride away very quickly <laughs> in the face of danger. <laughs> and um, some people suggest, well, you know, they probably didn't want to be mustered in the federal service. That way nobody could really tell them what to do. Right. <laughs> now, what, what's interesting is there's, a, there's one guy in this unit. Uh, I always like to um, uh, study a unit's pension records at the National Archives. Mm -hmm. But if they're not mustered in the federal service, they're not really going to be able to collect the pension. pension. Right. But I did. But there is a pension. Fo there's pension files for every unit. And so I looked to see if there was any pension files for this unit. And there was. Uh, two men tried to collect a pension. One guy, and I think it was on June 20th, uh, he ran into some Confederate scouts. They were uh, riding away from the Confederate scouts, and he was on a horse that was a little bit too rambunctious, and the horse ran into a tree, and the guy broke his leg, and he had to be sent back to Philadelphia. And he, his leg didn't really ever set well, and after the war, he tried to collect a pension from the federal government for his military service. And they were like, I'm sorry, there's no record of you being mustered into oh. federal service. Oh, man. So he couldn't collect his pension. <clears throat> but anyway, um, Samuel Randall has about 40 men. 
they leave Harrisburg, and Governor Curtin sends them to Gettysburg to be under the command of uh, uh, Granville O'Haller. Oh, and let's go to the next one. There's some great information about this unit in uh, the Gettysburg newspapers. We have three or four Gettysburg c citizens that kind of um, poke fun at them because they have an incredibly fancy dress uniform. And you can see here in this illustration, do you have the illustration up there? Um, of the armory of the first troop of Philadelphia City Cavalry. This is an 1863 engraving from the Free Library of Philadelphia. And yes, I traveled to the library to get this illustration. <laughs> I was so happy when I asked if they had anything on this unit and they broke out this illustration. Huh. But can you see the men on horseback with the what would you call that hat? Uh, what do they, they call that? A, the like plumed? A cursier helmet. A cursier, yeah, cursier. Cursier? Yeah, well, <laughs> you, you can try to say that okay, word. Okay, I'm not going <laughs> to. I'm not going to. My do pronunciation it. skills are not that great. You could, you could, Eric, you could zoom in on that so that, so that people could actually make it out on their phones. Let's, let's see if I can. Yeah. That's funny. Just make it bigger. Yeah, um, So, so, uh, they, so, so now in Gettysburg, you know, we had Granville cool. Howler in charge. Right. And then we have, uh, of course, the 21st Pennsylvania Cavalry, Company B, which is Robert Bell. You know, we talked about them, Robert Bell. And then we, the Adams County Cavalry. And then uh, uh, we got these scouts, these independent scouts. And then we got everyone that Granville Howler has talked into getting a shotgun and a shovel and a pickaxe. Yeah. And how, maybe, how successful was he at that? Um, we do have information that uh, companies are organized at several locations around Adams County. Uh, there's one formed in Bendersville and Middletown okay. and Littlestown and Mount Joy Township and New So Oxford. he's not just appealing to Gettysburg citizens. Yeah. He's going all over the place. And so they're forming these little militia units. What are these militia units going to do? That's another question. Right. But they're forming. As a matter of fact, in Bendersville, not too far north of here, uh, they organize a unit and they uh, have they have a man who has some military experience who commands the unit is drilling them and one of the men his gun accidentally discharges and kills another one the guys in well, the unit. during drill yeah during drill oh. so um let's go to the next slide eric so here's a diagram of basically what Granville O'Howler's plan is. And this is really Darius Couch's plan to, on June 15th, Albert Jenkins had captured Chambersburg. Now, they believe, they being the, the uh, federal authorities or the Pennsylvania officials, mm -hmm. that they are doing a good job of containing the invasion. The plan is to bring troops from Gettysburg, move them out west, block the South Mountain Range. Then they're going to bring troops in from the west, block the North Mountain Range along Tuscarora Summit. And then militia units that are now arriving in Harrisburg from New York and New Jersey will actually be marched down Route 11 through Shippensburg, and they will confront uh, Albert Jenkins' force. Let me say, go back to Tuscarora Summit. Who, who went out that far? Well, some Union troops, militiamen. Oh, came from, in. Came in. That, yes, that. they're coming in from the west. Because there's a there's a bar up on top of that, yes. that summit now. Yeah, yes. and a cool lookout over the well, valley. That bar has been there a long time. Yeah, I yes. bet. Yes. Well, I mean, that's now exactly I mean what, since the battle. That's exactly what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that, that area. They went to yes. the bar. Yes. Naturally. So, so what's interesting is the Pennsylvania officials believe that they are being successful in their um, containment of the Confederate forces. Uh -huh. We know that Albert Jenkins is just sent to Chambersburg and that on June 22nd, Rhodes Division is gonna cross, you know, over the Potomac and march into Pennsylvania and then into Chambersburg. Right. And then the Confederate Army will build their forces there until they break out and march across the state of Pennsylvania. But Granville O'Haller at Gettysburg, which is on the very right, of this map believes now only if he had a regiment of infantry he could send that regiment into the mountain range they could block the passes mm. and the confederates would have no chance of breaking through that defensive position and 
somebody, one of your um, uh, um, Patreon members asked a question. Do the state, do the officials in Pennsylvania really, really? think yeah. that these militiamen, militiamen are going to hold back this force? Who was that? To S- uh, Skip Wankman. I've studied it for a long time. I think Granville O'Howard does believe that he can hold the Confederate Army back. Which really? Is, With a regiment which of is green? very misguided. Wow. Very, very misguided. Is that simply by the power of his military prowess but that he's going to do But he goes around and he makes these speeches and he, like, even after he leaves Gettysburg, he goes to Hanover and makes a speech. And he goes back to York and makes a speech. He wants the invalids at the York Hospital to arm themselves and go out to stop Juba Early's offensive on York. What? And they, they, they basically run, they ride away. It, it just doesn't make any sense. What, Mike? Well, that would be me. I'd just be wandering out there yeah. with the info. <laughs> Oh, God. Mike, we go out there with his twisted ankle. Yeah. <laughs> They'll use you as a human shield. <laughs> Just put you in front of the trees they fell on the street. But I, I do think that they, I do believe they think they're serious. So um, let's go to the next slide now. Whoop. Yeah, that, that That's crazy to me, though. I mean, you would think he would know better than to you think, think that. He would know better being part of the Army of the Potomac. Yeah. Which was not allowed to move until they were prepared. Right. <laughs> right. And had trained for months and months and months and months. Uh, yeah, and had a combat experience. Yeah. Oh. So here, let's go to the, the next map. is June 21st, and there's a skirmish at Monterey. Basically, on June 21st, Granville O'Hower gets the Philadelphia City Troop that have arrived now, and the Adams County Cavalry, and... All the men with picks and shovels and axes and says, "Okay, let's go out to the pass at Monterey and we'll drop some trees across the road. Mm -hmm. So they go out there. They start building a barricade across the road near the Monterey house. It's interesting. I have a civilian account by a guy named Samuel Griffin who was with the Pennsylvania Reserves, had kind of went AWOL and returned to Gettysburg. He's actually from Fairfield, was living in Gettysburg with his sister during uh, this time period. And he actually went out to Waynesboro as a scout, gathered information on his own and brought, came back and delivered that information. He met Granville O'Howler at the Monterey House on the summit of South Mountain. And what's really interesting, Samuel Griffin, and uh, Granville Howler are both veterans of the Battle of Monterey hmm. and are in a hotel that's named after that battle. Yeah. Which I think that's is cool. fascinating. Yeah. I, I, I get a kick out of stuff like that. <laughs> so they're there, and all of a sudden, part of um, uh, Albert Jenkins' brigade comes riding up the mountain, and there's a skirmish there. That's why I have the Yellow Star. And later that evening, another detachment of Albert Jenkins' command rides over the mountain by way of Cold Springs Road, rides onto Tract Road, rides down through the town of Fairfield, and then rides up behind the barricade and rides right through where the men are building the barricade. Hmm. People jump to the sides of the road. People are firing their guns wildly, um, you know. 60 or so cavalrymen ride through the barricade, firing at everyone. No one is wounded in the skirmish. And I would say that this may be my problem with getting people interested in some of these things that happened before the battle. No one is killed. Except for Sando. Well, not yet. We can't. Well, we, yet. we didn't yeah. get there. Okay. But it's it, okay. When I say no one, very few people are killed in these skirmishes. You, you're not too fond of very few people. <laughs> very few people. Okay. That's no, good. I know what you mean, though. It's not. It's not big casualties and people like that. Unfortunately, yeah. 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 So let's go to the but next slide. But it is slide. interesting, though. Okay. Now we have a slide. So June 22nd, again, they're dropping trees along the passes. On June 23rd. Granville O'Hower, the Philadelphia City Troop, the Adams County Cavalry, and the militia from Arntsville. See the little blue line I have coming out of Arntsville and over to the uh, oh yeah to the, the flanking Route force. 30? Yeah, the militia of Arntsville, which includes a veteran of the War of 1812. Oh wow, <laughs> John Burns. This is John, the Arntsville <laughs> John Burns. John Burns is most likely at both of these engagements, although we don't have any. Wow 
documentation of the men who came out of Gettysburg to help build the barricade, I would suggest he's probably at both these engagements. Now, why do you say that? Because you said most likely. What, what he, makes you think because that? Because when Granville Howard asked for volunteers, uh -huh. I'm sure his hand was up. You think so? Yes. Yes, I think he's here. So then July 1st wasn't his first if we count, action against if, the if Confederates. We count, yeah, if we count these things. But again, Interesting. I don't have any... No, no one has mentioned positive information. We do know that Joseph Broadhead is involved in one of these. Right. Because uh, Sarah's worried. So where Joseph Broadhead is, the neighbor of John Burns, John Burns is probably there, too. OK, well, that might be that might explain then why on July 1st, he's like, come on, Broadhead. And yeah. Broadhead's like, oh, the uh, mess of beans. I have to pick a mess of beans. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, and so maybe John Burns is thinking, well, you were with me the other day. So yeah. why aren't you coming with me yeah. now? Well, Good day. The beans. So they're building a barricade along what is now Route 30. And I would say that this barricade, from all my reading of it, is being built um, in front of the Italian restaurant. Uh, okay. Do you know that one? Do yeah. What's, uh, what's, what's it called? Ciao Bella or Ciao something? Bella. Ciao Bella, yeah. That's right. I've always wanted and to try it. Across the street from the nursing home. Uh -huh. They're building a barricade across the road near that spot. Oh, the old people must have been yelling at them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and on June, yeah, on June 23rd, the Albert Jenkins guys again come up to a Caledonia furnace and one of Bell's Adams County Cavalry is on a horseback in the middle of the road and they chase him. And they chase him to the barricade and the men at the barricade flee into the woods. Of course. <laughs> They actually capture some of them, but they let them go because they weren't dressed in uniform. And, right. Probably um, felt bad for them. Yeah. And the Jenkins guys, the 14th Virginia Cavalry, chase the Adams County Cavalry back through the Cashtown Pass. And this is the incident we finally refer to as the bushwhacking. Oh, yeah. Okay. Where on June 23rd, a local... Let's go to the next one. I think I have a slide of it. Um. The star is on the uh, far left of the map, and it is near the base of a projection known as Gallagher's Knob. Oh, it's um, the old Adams County and map. And Henry Hahn, who lives north of Cashtown, um, uh, you can, along a tributary of uh, Marsh Creek, you can see where it says Henry Hahn. I got a circle there. He is drinking at the Willow Springs Hotel. And he becomes inebriated and announces that he's going to shoot himself a rebel. So he goes out along, uh, you know, the base of the mountain along the road and just happens to be hiding in the woods when the Confederates break through and chase the Adams County Cavalry down the road. And he actually kills a Confederate soldier. Does, does Han live pretty close to where the uh, round barn is now? Okay. The round barn would be, I don't know if you can see that weird intersection just below him where you see the yeah. new road. It's like a triangle. So, yeah, the triangle. He lives where the Cashtown um, Lions Park is. Okay. Yeah. So, if you go up. So, that's um, fairly close. Yeah, yeah, that's very close. So, it lives closer to the fruit stand, the fruit and vegetable yeah. stand there. Delicious. Uh, on the modern Route 30. But he kills a guy named Eli Amick. Eli Amick is the first soldier killed in Adams County during the Gettysburg Campaign. First Confederate soldier. First, first soldier first of soldier any killed, yeah. side. So, um, and then the Confederates retreat after after um, their. Uh, so now, killed. so now wait. So he. This is where. This is when Gordon's coming through. No. Oh, when is this? It's June twenty third. Okay. So June twenty third. And who's who is it? The uh, who who? What's the unit? Is um, it is it White? It's the Fourteenth Virginia Cavalry of Albert Jenkins Brigade. Okay. Yes. And so this kid goes out and he shoots himself it's a red. It's actually guys Henry Hans. Oh, oh, he's an old fellow. An older guy, yeah. So this old codger goes out and he shoots himself a reb. Yeah. And uh, they never find him? Um, no. Then he runs into the woods. He's with some of his friends. One of his um, uh, <laughs> one of his friends that he's now. with is an older guy named uh, Schultz. Okay. And um, he's like the great, 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 great grandfather of my fiance. Okay. So, oh, nice. You know, the Schultz nice. The are Schultzes. involved in that. Nice. And you can actually see them, the Schultzes on the map, too. And, and let me just tell you, they know about this, and they are very proud of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's, let's go to the next map. So that's uh, that, that all occurred on June 23rd. Now, in the meantime, 
Uh, the Jenkins Brigade is gathering supplies and provision. They hit Caledonia Furnace. They destroy the bridge of Scotland. They gather, they're, they're gath gathering up African American citizens and returning them back over the line into uh, Maryland and Virginia. And they're waiting for the advance of the Southern Infantry. Now, on June 24th, the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Regiment has been given uniforms, they've been given rifles. They've been giving ammunition. They've each fired their weapon once or twice. Okay. And now they're ready. So they're well trained. They're well trained. Yeah. They're put on the train and they're sent to Gettysburg. Okay. And then Granville O'Hower is going to use them as a blocking force in the mountain range against the advance. This is his mighty regiment that he's. That's right. Yes. Well, what happens? And uh, if you know railroad history, these um, soldiers are put on the two trains, and the train is called a special. At, you know, at this time, trains run on a regular schedule. Yeah. But this is an unscheduled train. So there's a lady, and she's moving her cow oh. from one field to another over a deep cul-de-sac gully known that swift run passes through okay under the railroad tracks this is out route 30 out it's on route 30 east um probably about six miles from gettysburg swift run you can still see the modern route 30 and where swift run crosses and south of it would be where the uh, incident occurred so she's hurrying her cow across the top of the bridge and all of a sudden a train comes around the corner <laughs> She runs as fast as she can. She tries to get her cow off the tracks. She dives off the track at the last moment. The cow doesn't make it. Oh. The train hits the cow. The train derails. Wow. That's a fat and cow. And all the men in the boxcars on the first train are thrown sideways. <laughs> Some of the men are slightly injured. The cow is uh, chopped up and ate for dinner. Oh, they had the cow for dinner. <laughs> um <laughs> Delicious. But the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency <laughs> Regiment, the trains are halted, the men un unboard the trains into a field next to the tr tracks where they're trapped for the next two days. Okay. Because they're six miles from Gettysburg, and there's absolutely no way for them to possibly get to town. <laughs> So they just camp <laughs> in the field that night. They can't walk. And they wait until the train gets back on the track. This must have been just killing Granville O'Hower. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Why can't they walk the other six miles? <laughs> exactly. So they get into camp. Okay. So finally, on the morning of June 26th, they, they, they get the train back on the track, and they get on the trains, and they ride... Uh, into Gettysburg, and they disembark in the town that morning. Now, about 100 of them on June 25th walked the long, long six miles to Gettysburg and arrived. <laughs> and Hauer said, well, you know, they got there on the evening of June 25th, and the guy, rest of your guys are coming in in the morning, you might as well just wait. So they didn't get sent out to the mountain range as they anticipated on the 24th or the 25th. It'll be not until the 26th. Okay. Now let's go to the next one. Uh, this is Michael Jacobs. Oh, yeah, the old professor. Uh, he's a professor at Gettysburg College, and he wrote a book, uh, The Rebel Invasion of Maryland and Pennsylvania in the Battle of Gettysburg. His book, it's, it says in it that it's printed in 1864, but we know that... People are reading it in December of 1863 because there's an article in the New York Times about how officers in the Army of the Potomac are reading this book. Okay. Granville O'Hower does not appreciate this book at all. Oh. Michael Jacobs suggests in his book that Granville O'Hower knows the Southern Army is coming over that mountain. And he sends the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Regiment out there to sacrifice themselves. <sighs> and of course, you know, Howard has no idea uh, yeah. that uh, Southerners are going to be coming over the mountain on June 26th. He was just hoping to get them moving and get out there so that they could block um, the uh, Chambersburg Pike. So it's not that the 26th is coming back to Gettysburg to defend Gettysburg. It's that 
this is where the rail line ends, and yeah. they're going to get off here, and yeah. then they're going to proceed west on foot. This is, and this is part of the general plan has come been come up with by Darius Couch and Granville Howard, nice and, they, yeah. and they've been talking about it. So let's go to the next map there, uh, Eric. The morning of June 26th. So the 26th Emergency Regiment reaches Gettysburg. They eat breakfast. The people in the town feed them. The townspeople are very, very happy to see this large amount of men, including Company A that has returned to Gettysburg with nice uniforms sure. and muskets. Looking and, handsome. Um, and, and what is uh, just a parade, they march out to Chambersburg Pike, and they go about four miles. And they decide, well, it's time to go into camp. So they go into camp. We've walked really far today, along guys. Along Marsh Creek, about four miles, three, you know, four miles west of Gettysburg. Um, and uh, they also stop because um, William Wesley Jennings has received some disturbing reports from Robert Bell of the Adams County Cavalry. Mm-mm. And they decide before they proceed any further, they should relay this information back to Granville O'Hower. Because citizens from western Adams County are fleeing across Route 30 in huge numbers saying that the Confederate Army is advancing from Franklin County into Adams. And so now we're on the morning of June 26, and we'll talk about the different things that happened here. So I know it took a long time to get here. Yeah, well, you know, there's some buildup. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's go to the next one. Do I have Juba early at the next one? Old Jube. Sure do. So, there's a couple interesting things that I, that I have learned over the years about uh, Richard Yule. One of them is that it seems like the plan of invasion is Yule's plan. There's a great quote by Robert E. Lee um, early on. Um, at 7 a.m. on June 19th, General Lee sent a dispatch to General Yule, who was at that time near Harris Hagerstown, telling him to carry out the plan that he had proposed. Oh, so, okay. On June 25th, Juba Early leaves his division, which had just reached the area of Greenwood in eastern Franklin County, Mm -hmm. just to the west of Adams County. Right. Juba Early rides to Chambersburg, and meets with Richard Yule, and he discussed the plan. And basically, it seems as first, their plan is to march across to Adams in York County, destroy the Columbia Wrightsville Bridge. And then uh, he's going to turn and march to Harrisburg and join in with uh, another column under Robert Rhodes that's proceeding um, uh, north with Yule to Carlisle and is going to attack Harrisburg. And uh, A.P. Hill's uh, corps will come up and proceed eastward and follow Juba early. According to this, um, uh, you know, the best information we have uh, from the official reports. It does seem, however, that when Early had expected that the federal authorities would destroy the bridge at Wrightsville. Right. Now, when he gets to York and they haven't destroyed the bridge yet, that's when he gets the idea he can capture the bridge. Hmm. And then he has this crazy idea in his autobiography that he'll put his whole division on horses that he's going to steal from Lancaster <laughs> County and he'll ride to Philadelphia. <laughs> Which I'm just like, what? Yeah. Well, you know. His it's... orders are to destroy the bridge and then proceed to Harrisburg. So if he could capture the bridge, he could cross and then he could then march on Harrisburg it, yeah. from that direction. Sure. So, I mean, the bridge intact would be nice. So Juba Early is the one who's going to march across Adams County on June 26th. And his force, I just thought I'd mention this, includes four infantry brigades. Uh, General Harry T. Hayes, the Louisiana Tigers. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brigadier General John Brown Gordon's Georgians. Colonel Isaac Avery's North Carolinians. And William F. Smith's or extra Billy Smith's Virginians. He also has 16 pieces of artillery along under the command of Lieutenant Hillary Jones. And ahead of his column, he's going to have two cavalry units uh, for support, temporarily attached to his brigade, or his, uh, I'm sorry, his command. The 35th Virginia Battalion of Cavalry under Lieutenant Colonel Elijah White 
and the 17th Virginia Cavalry under Colonel William French. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh. So the first thing they do before they march off is they destroy the furnace of Thaddeus Stevens. So he doesn't have any heat in his house. Yeah, in Caledonia. One, oh, one not that kind of furnace. Yeah. Sorry. At the time, Stevens' total losses were estimated to be between $80,000 and $100,000. Easily the greatest single monetary loss of any person in Pennsylvania during the campaign. I bet. What, what is that in today's money, do you know? Huh. A lot. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> so Stevens was never compensated for his money. And to his credit, Stevens never filed for compensation um, uh, for you know because his furnace was destroyed. Oh, okay. The uh, Caledonia furnace uh, it became an active site in 1830 when a forge was built there uh, by Thaddeus Stevens and James Paxton. Stevens came to Gettysburg in 1816. Uh, it was named after Caledonia, uh, Stevens' birthplace, Caledonia County, Vermont. Uh. Um, in 1842, Stevens bought Paxton out and added a rolling mill in 1852. At the height, the furnace lands consisted of 12,000 acres. Wow. In both Adams and Franklin County. One source suggested maybe at one point he owned 18,000 acres. There's a suggestion that the furnace, along with Pine Grove Furnace, connected to the Underground Railroad because a large amount of people that work there are, are black. And, you know, when you look in the census, they all say they're from Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. But, you know. Yeah. Um, so wait, this picture, though, that you're showing or that we were showing. This is an 1890 picture after they rebuilt the furnace. After they rebuilt. So, so the, you, the building on the right in the picture, uh -huh. is that the building that's still there, the that's, blacksmith shop? No. Okay. The blacksmith shop's way off to the left okay this furnace show or this is the building in front of the furnace where you would uh make the iron uh you know put the iron ore into uh pig iron or make uh things out of the iron ore if you look behind the building on the right can you see there's a stone furnace there that you can kind of still see that's the yeah. furnace smokestack okay and then there's a like a a pier that goes out to the top of the smokestack where you bring uh -huh. uh, the uh, charcoal. And believe me, I'm not an expert on furnaces. <laughs> but uh, this is the rebuilt furnace in 1890. It's the only image we have of it. Okay. But there is a mo that furnace, they d built a replica of it today. And if you go down to Caledonia, if you look on the right, there's a parking lot and the, the rebuilt furnace is there. And they actually have a nice uh, plaque on it that tells you about the Confederates burning it. It's fascinating that Juber Early ordered destruction of the furnace himself. And after the war, in his, his uh, autobiography, he was very specific. And he said that, you know, these Stevens was an enemy of the South, and he ordered the furnace to be burned. In some of his speeches in Congress, Mr. Stevens had exhibited a most vindicative spirit towards the people of the South, and he continued to do so to the day of his death. The burning was simply in retaliation for the various deeds of barbarity perpetrated by federal troops in some of the southern states. And so was the subsequent burning of Chambersburg. <laughs> <laughs> so he goes on. You know, it's interesting that he's not very apologetic no. in his post-war writings. Yeah, no, he's... I like, uh, I like it. Um, there's some interesting reaction in the northern newspapers about the destruction of that East Stevens furnace. Because he, in some respects in the North, wasn't that popular either. Especially in the Democratic newspapers did not support his... Uh, his policies. He's kind there's of a, a radical guy. Yeah, isn't there's he? a Democratic Lancaster County newspaper, and they say, in a speech delivered before the Republican County Convention, which met in Fulton, ha Fulton Hall in this city on September 3rd last, Mr. Stevens said, abolition, yes, abolish everything on the face of the earth for this union. Free every slave, slay every traitor, burn every rebel mansion, if these things are necessary to preserve the temple of freedom to the world and our prosperity. And basically, that's what we did. And the paper said, curses like chickens come home to roost, so says the old proverb, and Mr. Stevens has had it verified his entire destruction of his iron works. <laughs> Here's my favorite. This is from a Southern newspaper. And this guy's writing from Hagerstown 
and he learned that Juba Early's marched to Gettysburg and he destroyed Thaddeus Stevens' furnace on the way. All honest men throughout the world will be rejoiced to hear that the inalignant demigod and abolitionist, I can't even say that word, <laughs> Thaddeus Stevens of Pennsylvania has received some of his punishment due for his enormous crimes against the happiness of the human race. Oh, man. He owns a large iron works and mill in Adams County on the border, which I am informed have been utterly destroyed. His machinery, aqueducts, buildings, and supplies for his operatives, including, it is said, 20,000 pounds of bacon, have been swept away. <laughs> Amen will be the involuntary exclamation of every lover of justice and every foe of hypocrisy. <laughs> Good stuff. He kinda, I love the way you read these. Okay. You gotta love the 20,000 pounds of bacon, though. That sounds like heaven to me. I think, and I think I was taken on uh, June 23rd, and it was not destroyed. It was used by the Confederate Army. Now, and they, they, but they stole a lot of stuff from there, right? Before they destroyed yeah. it, right? So they visited the furnace three times. So let's go to the next line. Hey, we're here Since again. we have Thaddeus Stevens. Um, they came on the 16th, Albert Jenkins. They returned on the 23rd at the advance of Juba Early's division. And then uh, on June 25th, the night of June 25th, June 26th is when they burned the furnace. Okay. And uh, you know what's interesting? Uh, and you don't learn this until much later when you get these Thaddeus Stevens biographies. You know, the, the Confederates surely didn't know it. Thaddeus Stevens was at the furnace on June 16th when the rebels rode up. Really? Yeah, and he got on a horse, rode to Shippensburg, got on the train, and got out of there. Oh. <laughs> well, he was they a target. Almost. Wow, they almost had him. Almost had him. Can you imagine if no. the Confederates had captured wow. Thaddeus Stevens? That would have been interesting. Speak up, what? He said, he, Jubal early said that if they had if, caught him, they would have killed him. They would have killed him. Cut up his body. Sure. The bones to every state in the Confederate, or every territory in the Confederacy. Yeah. I mean, he was just reviled, but, you know. Yeah, they didn't like him. It, it'd be interesting. It would have been interesting to see what would have happened. Okay. So, on the morning of June 26, after the destruction of Thaddeus Stevens' furnace, um, which apparently was burned by, um, I think I have an uh, account that it's uh, Colonel French that's put in charge of burning it, the 17th uh, Virginia Cavalry. So um, they head out across the mountain range, and they were on old Route 30. New Route 30 was not built yet. Right, right. So they head out, you know, uh, you know, um, once you pass, if you're coming from Caledonia, once you pass uh, Mr. Ed's, there's a little road that goes off to the yeah, left. old 30. And then it veers off and cuts across in front of you to the right, mm -hmm. and goes down by that barn, yep. that area we call Newman's. Why do we call it I don't know. Newman's? Oh, okay. Because of Seinfeld. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but but uh, it is, it's a Newman's Tavern at that location. So so that's where that would have basically tied into old route 30, yeah. New Route 30 yeah. today going yeah. towards Caledonia, yeah. that old road. And that that's the road that goes past the Cash Town. That's right. So inn. they pass by Newman's yeah. and they ride down through the gap, the same route that the 14th Virginia Cavalry used to chase the Ryle Rebels Adams County Cavalry on June 23rd, just three days later. And they go by the Willow Springs Hotel where the bushwhacker was drinking mm -hmm. and they come to an intersection. And they had no way of knowing it. But that is a very important intersection in the history of Adams County. The road straight ahead goes to Cashtown. And that road was laid out in uh, about 1815, you know, okay. give, give or take a few, you know, uh, when exactly it was opened up, 1815. To the left, the road goes down and it goes out across through Hilltown and it goes out to Mummersburg and then out to Goldenville and out towards Hunterstown. So sort of like northeast. Yeah. And that is... The old Black Scap Road that was laid out in 1747. Wow, That's the road across old. which George Washington passed when he came through Adams County, coming back from the Whiskey Rebellion. Okay. So Jubilee really doesn't know it, but he's following the same road that George, George Washington, Washington passed along. <laughs> and so at that intersection, apparently Juba Early gets word. Now, is it you know is it a uh, from the locals? Probably not. Is it from a scout he sent ahead? But he learns that a force of militia has marched out of Gettysburg and they're formed somewhere near Marsh Creek ahead of him. Okay. So in his, um, in his uh, autobiography, 
which is written years later. Juba Early says that at this point, he decided to separate his force and he's going to send Gordon's brigade straight ahead towards the militia with the 35th Virginia Battalion of Cavalry, about 200 men in front of that brigade. Okay. And then the other three brigades in his column with the artillery will actually take the Hilltown Road and march to Mummersburg. And he says that he's going to swing them around to attack the rear of the militiamen while Gordon hits him head on. I don't buy this for a moment. Why not? I think he would have separated his force at that junction anyway. He wants to send the man across Adams County on two parallel roads. And besides that, the, there's not going to be any militia there by the time the other three brigades get into position to outflank them. They're gone. They're going to be gone. Okay. <laughs> and I think he probably knows that. Okay. So let's go to the next uh, slide, Eric. It's a slide of a house. It is the Brook Tavern. Oh, and you know, I didn't mention this, but if we go back one slide... Do you see I have in black, I have circled Mary Brook. Do you see how she's a near neighbor of Henry Hahn, the bushwhacker, on that? Mm. But if you go to the next one now, the house, that's the Widow Brook's Tavern. Uh, her husband had died, and she was running the tavern with her uh, sons and daughters at the time of the Civil War. And um, uh, Juba Early stops at the tavern and goes in. And... She has something on the wall that he is really interested in. She has the 1858 Adams County wall map on oh, her wall. I have that on my wall. Oh, very good. I love that one. <laughs> let's see if I can. Let's see if I can find out where I have cool. my, where I have my account of this. <laughs> now was that is that you or that was no, me? that was you? That was me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um. Let's see. It's interesting that I I almost felt like I was taunting myself, in that in that um, in that um. You were taunting. Yeah, that's what happens. You taunt yeah. yourself from. Yeah. From I was going to see if I had her age. I don't have her age here, but here's an account written about this, and I want to point out that this account is written by James Watt de Peister in 1866. Okay. So this is three years after the battle this is written. And it's, uh, it's published in a book in 1867. When Early came along on June 26, he stopped at DeWitter Brooks, a clever hostess, or clever hostess, hostess. I'm sorry, <laughs> hostess, hostess, on a side cool. road parallel to the Chambersburg Pike. Like many residents, she owned a capital map of Adams County, which showed all the roads, the farms, the dwellings, etc. These maps were sought out by our own cavalry and served as very reliable guides. Huh. Early asked the widow what she had paid for her map, and when she answered $5, and that's awesome because we know they were sold for $5 yeah. originally. It's yeah. in the newspaper. But declined to sell it. He called upon one of his staff for that amount in greenbacks, handed the money over to Mrs. Brook, and then cut out the topographical center, leaving here the illustrations within, which encompass the map part like a frame. The widow, a right pleasant woman, must have a grim humor of her own. For now, hanging up in the <laughs> mutilated center of the map, she has inserted in the vacant space a printed list of the rebel dead at Gettysburg. Oh, man. <laughs> nice. I like this chick. That's pretty cool. So we have, we know that this account is accurate because in 1905, there's actually an article in the Gettysburg Star and Sentinel that talks about this map. This is 1905. Uh -huh. A most interesting relic and one whose existence is known to but a few citizens of Adams County is an old map of Adams County now in the possession of Harrison Brook who lives about above Cashtown. It is one of the maps gotten out in 1858 by G.M. Hopkins, and during the Civil War, it hung on a wall in a bar room in the Brook Tavern, which was conducted by Peter Brook. He had died, and Mary was running it. The father of the present owner of the relic. When Juba Early made his famous raid through southern Pennsylvania in June of 1863, he stopped at the Little Mountain Tavern for a refreshment one hot day, and on entering the barroom, gl his glance fell on the map. Realizing the great help this would be, 
to him and leading the troops through the strange and hostile land, Early took his penknife out and cut out the portion of the map which describes Gettysburg and the surrounding country. Huh. From that day, the mutilated map has never been taken down and still hangs on the wall of the room which was once the old tavern. Wow. So until at least 1905... That's, this that's thing been up hung there. on. Do we know what happened to it? No. Uh, of course not. No. But, but you know, um, it's not there anymore. I, I've talked to the owners, current owners, the previous owners. Um, actually, I wonder where it's got to be somewhere. You don't just get rid of that. Yeah. Maybe was there a fire or anything? I don't know. But it's kind of cool. So he got a map from this. Okay. Now let's continue on. Oh, there's the next slide is the 1858 Adams County wall map. And you can see what they're talking about, how the center of the map is a topographical map of the county. Mm -hmm. But then the illustrations in the town sort of frame. It, yeah. You see how you cut out the center of the map and wasn't just interested in the outside of it. Like pictures of landmark buildings in the different Wouldn't towns. Wouldn't it have been easier just to rip the whole map off the wall? I though? think it would have been. Just roll it up. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Whoop. My, my slides. I think... When he sl switches his slides, it switches mine. <laughs> you think so? Yeah, okay. I don't think it works that way. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. So here's a map from Wilbur Nye, the Civil War guy. <laughs> so this is in 1965. Cool. Wilbur, <laughs> Wilbur Nye did an article in um, Civil War Times Illustrated on June 26th, and it may be my first reading of June 26th, mm -hmm. and I'm a big fan of Wilbur and I. Okay. I'm going to say that because we're going to be critical of him later when, with one of the viewers' questions, one of the viewer or the listeners', listeners questions. questions. Yeah. Um, but you can see here on this map, it's a great map that he drew, that uh, if you look way on the left, on the other side of Hilltown, you see the, where the road divides, and Juba Early of three brigades marches to Mummersburg. And Gordon, with Elijah White's cavalrymen ahead of him, rides to, directly towards the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Regiment in Marsh Creek. And you can see that on the map. Now, basically, I'll just do a little overview of what happens. Um, Robert Bell and uh, William Wesley Jennings realize, hey, there's a cloud of smoke coming down the road, and there's a massive Confederate force about to fall on our untested, inexperienced militia. So Jennings decides, you know what? I'm not going to wait for orders from Howard. Let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> Good thinking. So about 40 men are actually on a skirmish line on the other side of Marsh Creek, and they will attempt to hold off White's Comanches. Meanwhile... The other 100 men or 700 men or so head out, and they go up Belmont Road. Mm -hmm. And Belmont Road today runs into Goldenville Road. Mm -hmm. And you can see just to the right of where it says Mummersburg, they get on to um, the Goldenville Road. They actually cross over the Mummersburg Road. They get onto the Goldenville Road, and they head out towards um, Hunterstown. But they are very very slow. <laughs> they are not marching as quickly as Jennings had hoped. Meanwhile, there's a <laughs> serious skirmish at Marsh Creek. And I believe that's where um, Luther Slater and uh, one of the other captains who is unnamed is actually captured with the uh, skirmish line as White's men approach. Um, no one that we know of is wounded at the Battle of Marsh Creek. So the Confederates overrun and capture all the men on the skirmish line. Meanwhile, um, and then the 21st, I should mention, the 21st, uh, I'm sorry, Robert Bell's cavalry we right, talked about. Right. Um, they actually turn around and race back to Gettysburg at this point. And Howard is there waiting for them when they get there. Howard hops a horse himself also actually takes a horse from one of the Robert Bell's guys who ends up, you know, kind of being captured because of it, and they ride off to Hanover. So they ride away, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But meanwhile, Juber Early gets a message 
that the force that they were fighting against has fled and they're not going to be able to catch him. It's interesting. I wonder how the messenger for White gets to Early. Does he ride across Crooked Creek Road to Momsburg? You guys ever ride on oh, yeah. Crooked Creek Road? Yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's pretty crooked. Did they go all the way back? And then uh, I'm sure they take one of their side roads to get to Mummersburg. Yeah. Uh, but meanwhile, Juba Early's three brigades are passing through Hilltown and out towards Mummersburg. Now, I should mention it. There's a guy in one of uh, the uh, Virginia regiments. I think he's with a Smith's Brigade that says that during the march, they pass through a little town uncouthly called by the residents Helltown. <laughs> and he seems very perplexed by it. It's that Pennsylvania accent. Helltown. <laughs> so um, uh, Juber Early uh, runs over to Colonel French, the 17th Virginia Cavalry, and says, hey, head out through Mummersburg and see if you can catch that uh, regiment that is fleeing from that uh, battle site. And you see up on the top of the map, the 17th Virginia Cavalry under Flan French pursue. And when you get to the Belmont Goldenville Road intersection, and uh, anybody who lives local will know where that is. It's not far from Russell's Tavern where George Washington mm -hmm. spent the night when he was on that road we were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they start picking up stragglers from the long, lengthy march. Can you imagine? These guys already marched like five miles that day. <laughs> <laughs> they start picking them up along the road. And they cross over the uh, Biglerville Road, which at that time would be called the Newville Road. And they cross over uh, the old Carlisle Road, which is now called Table Rock Road. And just beyond that, at a place called the Whitmer Farm, Colonel Jennings says, okay, they're catching up with us. So he places his men in a line of battle, and we have um, the Battle of the Whitmer Farm or the Battle of Goldenville Road or sometimes you hear it referred to as the Battle of Bailey's Hill. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. They fire two or three or four volleys at the Southerners. Um one man in the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Regiment is wounded in this battle. Okay. Uh, we do not have any evidence that any of French's guys, the 17th Virginia, are wounded in the fight. Although, several guys in the 26th maintain that guys in the 17th Virginia Cavalry were wounded. But we don't have any evidence of that. Right, okay. But f shots are exchanged. You think about it, they got... I don't know how many men they lost by that point. Let's say they have 500 men on the firing line and they fire three rounds. That's 1,500 bullets. They're probably still out there in the fields around that area. There you go. I've never found a bullet there. Oh, you've looked? Yeah. I'm sure they've all been. So um, they were fired wildly, so the bullets were probably they're not. probably in like, trees. Yeah, they're probably not uh, <laughs> in the same in the yeah. place. And uh, should I mention, I, I didn't mention this. The whole time we're talking about this day, it's raining. It oh, rained yeah, that's on right. June 26th. Yes, yes. So what ends up happening? After uh, after they fire a few rounds, and they're pretty sure that the Confederates are kind of spooked by the fire of all these men. That's a lot of men, 500 mm -hmm. men firing at you. And French probably only has a couple hundred guys with him. So the, the 26th, Jennings says, let's get out of here now. And so they start their retreat. And the 26th, Pennsylvania Emergency Regiment. Let's see what I have coming up next. Oh, let's go to the next slide. Well, I don't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't write. Put something in there. This. Uh, this. This. Uh, uh, nice looking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm proud of myself on this map. Here I call it the Battle of Bailey's Hill because the Bailey family lives at the base of the hill also, okay. and sometimes it's referred to as that. So they. You can see they retreat up across country through the era of York Springs, oh. and they retreat back to Harrisburg. Okay. The men march for 55 of the next 60 hours. <laughs> 55 of the next 60 uh -huh. hours. Okay. And they make it to Harrisburg. And the whole time, 
It's they are convinced the Confederates are about to overtake them and are chasing <laughs> them the whole way. So that they camp after a four mile march earlier in the day, but they make 55 miles. They, well, 55 hours, 55, oh, 55 out of hours. 60 consecutive hours, they just march <laughs> until they get to Harrisburg. Amazing. I don't know how many miles they covered, but it's a pretty good distance. Yeah. Yeah, that is a good distance. And they wanted they, their plan was to try to get back to the railroad somehow and get back on the train, but they couldn't. They had to they had to go a different way. But now, did they? Uh, isn't early with roads somewhere up around there? Or are they not up that way yet? No, they actually go farther to the east and manage to avoid that. Okay. Now, when they get to Harrisburg, yeah, two hundred and fifty of them are missing, hmm. and uh, we know that um, forty of them are captured in Marsh Creek. Or give or take a few. Right. 170 of them are captured at the Battle of Bailey's Hill. And the next morning, they're gathered in the square of Hunterstown. And Juba Early gives them a lecture. <laughs> and he lets them go. Really? And they march across to Shippensburg, where they're captured by Johnson's division. And Johnson's division, who's on their way back from Carlisle, yeah. orders them to take off their shoes. And he steals all the shoes from them, and then he walked barefoot to Harrisburg. The birth of the shoe myth, right? Is this yeah, what you're saying? Johnson needs shoes. So, wait a sec. So, uh, do, is there an account of Early's lecture to them? No. No. Oh. But there is a nice little uh, account of Juba Early going to Gettysburg and talking to the other 40 men that were captured at Marsh Creek. Because after the while the fight for Bailey's Hill is going on, Early... Then is told by a st by an aide or a staff officer or somebody who wrote up that that Gordon's pushing to Gettysburg, and so Juba Early rides to Gettysburg. Right. Okay. And when he gets there, of course, we're going to talk about what he does in Gettysburg. But one of the things he does is he gathers the forty men from the twenty six Pennsylvania Emergency Regiment at the courthouse steps. Right. And he tells them that it's lucky they ran so quickly, or someone <sighs> might got hurt. <laughs> And one of the accounts says something like he lectures them and tells them to go home to their mommies. Yeah. So Juba Early can be kind of harsh. Yeah. You know. Um, so okay. also on this map, I wanted to point out while we're looking at it, you see the line of the uh, Robert Bell's Adams County Cavalry are riding off towards Hanover Junction. And the Philadelphia City Troop, uh, some of them ride up to Hunterstown and then over across to New Oxford and out Route 30. But the Union forces retreat uh, across to Adams County and to, uh, to get back to, uh, they're on their way to Hanover Junction and then they go to York and they're at York when the Confederate pr troops approach York and then they go to Wrightsville. And they're there at Wrightsville, all these troops, um, minus the 26th Emergency Regiment who are on their way to Harrisburg. <laughs> right. But to get to Wrightsville uh, when, the, when the bridge is attacked by Gordon and the bridge is burned. Okay. But first, Gordon has to get into Gettysburg, right? That's right. All right. So let's go so, to the next slide. Well, now, wait, are we going to Gordon right now? Yeah. All right, so let's do this, because this is where it gets exciting for the people in Gettysburg. Let's take our break, and then when we come back, we'll finish up what happens in Gettysburg on June 26th with Gordon's uh, uh, brigade visiting uh, for the evening, and uh, then we'll get to everybody's questions, okay? So we will be right back. Ah, the season is finally here. 2021 is going to be a great year, and we know that you're going to come down to Gettysburg. And when you do come down to Gettysburg, you got to take a tour with Getty's Bike Tours. Getty's Bike Tours has been in business since 2005. It is the best way to see the battlefield. Why? Because you don't just see the battlefield, you experience the battlefield. Our tours are led by some of the finest licensed battlefield guides out there, and they make sure that you walk away with a full understanding of what happened here on those three days in 1863. Here's the best part. Because you're an addressing Gettysburg listener, you're going to get 15% off when you make your reservation. Now, this discount only applies to tours. So go to Gettysbike.com or call 717-752-7752 and book a tour today. Getty's Bike Tours. Think outside the bus. There's just no better way to see the town you're visiting than to eat your way through it. Enjoy a culinary and cultural experience through historic downtown Gettysburg one delicious bite at a time with Savor Gettysburg Food Tours. Their season runs from April through November with a special Christmas Tastes and Traditions walking food tour during the month of December. Savor Gettysburg Food Tours offers an unmatched three-hour food tasting experience coupled with a cultural and historical walking tour of the 
town of Gettysburg. Their walking food tour lets you get an inside view and taste of Gettysburg's most loved eateries. Choose from several unique tours. Experience the history and culture that only Gettysburg can offer. Go to SaverGettysburgFoodTours.com and enter promo code AG2021 to receive $5 off your tour. Eat, walk, and savor Gettysburg. Have you noticed our revamped website at AddressingGettysburg.com? Well, that's the fine work of a man named Mike Stretch, and he also redid our logo for us. Both of them I originally designed, and both of them were originally horrible. But now they're nice, and that's all thanks to Mike. Mike has an awesome t-shirt company called Heritage Depot. There you'll find great designs based on Gettysburg and the Civil War with t-shirts and other types of merchandise. So go to heritage-depot.com and spruce up your Gettys nerd wardrobe. That's heritage Dash depot.com. Our favorite bookstore in Gettysburg is For the Historian, located at 42 York Street. Isn't it, Eric? You're darn tootin', Matt. <laughs> it's because they have the best selection of Civil War books in Gettysburg, both new and used, and online they have even more books to choose from. But Matthew, what if the Civil War is simply not my thing? Not a problem, my fine four offender friend. This is For the Historian, after all. They cover history from the ancient world to the 21st century with a strong selection of World War II and American Revolution books. It's astounding how they squeeze thousands of titles from Osprey, Savas Beatty, UNC Press, and more into their store. And it's also astounding how you and I both squeeze into our pants every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, handsome, they have a warehouse too, and that's where they keep all those books that are available online at ForTheHistorian.com. And folks, if you go to ForTheHistorian.com now and order books until you're blue in the face, be sure you mention that you heard about them on Addressing Gettysburg in the note to seller box and they will refund your shipping costs. What if I prefer to browse in the store and don't want to go online to get my book? Great question, Doodlebug. Just mention addressing Gettysburg at checkout and they'll take 20% off the retail price of your item. So go to ForTheHistorian.com, stop by 42 York Street, or call 717-685-5207. That's ForTheHistorian.com or 717-685-5207. Gettysburg, a nation-divided mobile app, is relaunching this summer. Gettysburg, a nation-divided is an award-winning mixed-reality mobile application using augmented reality technology. It transports users into the most crucial moments in the Battle of Gettysburg, the turning point of the Civil War. Users can listen and watch historic figures share their stories as lifelike animated avatars, traverse 360-degree image sequences of the battlefield. Its cinematic battle sequences are narrated by actor Scott Eastwood. The mobile app is available for free on iOS and Android. It's designed to be used anywhere, at home, at school, at the park, or at Gettysburg National Military Park. It uses GPS to help guide you through your journey to see the stories and events unfold at the exact location where they occurred. So go into your phone's app store and get it now for free. That's Gettysburg, a nation divided. Hey, are you planning on spending some time in Gettysburg soon? Well, you got to check out GettysburgBattlefieldTours.com as your source for things to do. Tickets are available for exclusive experiences such as the Sunset Double Decker Battlefield Tour, Adams County Port Tour Shuttle, and Discoveries Beyond Gettysburg. For details, follow them on Facebook or visit GettysburgBattlefieldTours.com. That's GettysburgBattlefieldTours.com. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg with Matt Callery. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, once again, those of you watching on uh, Facebook Live, uh, put your questions in the comments if you've gotten any. If you've gotten any. If you have any. And um, we are going to go on now. Tim, where are we now? We're, uh, Gordon's Brigade's about to enter Gettysburg. Is that right? So, you know, uh, yeah, I'd like to point out, though, we have an image up here of the dedication ceremony, the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Militia Monument, 1892. And, um, you know, you might detect a bit of sarcasm in my voice when I talk about these guys. And, you know, I realize that these men were untrained. Uh, they had no idea what they were getting themselves into. And the concept of inexperienced soldiers, especially, you know, 
like to college students, right. uh, stopping battle-hardened <laughs> Confederate veterans that have been serviced for a couple years yeah. is just ridiculous. Yeah. But and what I, else could they do? Yeah. Right? You have to feel like, you got to feel like you're doing something. Yeah. Oh, I think so. Yeah. And um, in later years, the members of the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Regiment struggled to find their place in the history of the war. Many looked upon the whole episode as a fiasco. One gentleman, uh, one veteran of the unit said it was picturesque and interesting, perhaps, but without substantial <coughs> consequence. Others, however, and this maybe is why I make a little bit of fun of them, <laughs> went absolutely overboard. And one of them was Samuel Pennypacker, who later served as the governor of Pennsylvania from 1901 to 1906. Mm -hmm. He made all sorts of wild, exaggerated claims as to the importance of the encounter. Um, uh, Henry Richards, who wrote about it later of Company A, said the men in the 26th were the first troops to oppose the entrance of the rebels into Pennsylvania, which, of course, is not <laughs> true. Not true. The first to meet the enemy at Gettysburg and the first to draw blood in that historic combat. <laughs> um, whose blood? Their own? Yeah. He further claimed <laughs> that they materially delayed the advance of Lee's army and saved Harrisburg from capture. Wow. The whole army stopped for that one regiment. He concluded, with the knowledge of events which we now possess, who can deny that these occurrences were not instrumental in the salvation of the entire nation? <laughs> Oh, come on. <laughs> Let me suggest that the presence of the 26th Emergency Regiment, and it actually sped up the Southern advance. Right. Not slowed it down. Okay, why is that? How's that? Because they were chasing those guys. Right. <laughs> they they went faster than they would have. Right, right. <laughs> it didn't slow down the Confederate no. advance. No. <laughs> so anyway, um, it is an interesting episode in uh, the battle and then the veterans are very proud of their role in the monument and the role in the battle and the, they have a monument there at the uh, Buford Avenue and uh, the edge of Chambersburg Street and you can see their monument today mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so let's let's go to the next uh, slide to map again now we talked about um, the, the 26th emergency regiment uh, retreat to Harrisburg Bells Adams County Cavalry and the Philadelphia City Troop, I should mention, come storming through the town. The 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Regiment had come in on train, remember, right. that morning. Their trains were sitting on the tracks on the eastern side of town. And a detachment of the 26th was in the town of Gettysburg guarding the trains. When the Confederates, when Bells Cavalry rides by and the Philadelphia City Troop ride by, and they actually stay there, and there's a small skirmish between them and the advance of the Confederates as they approach their um, outpost on the eastern edge of town. So now, there's actually gunfire in the town between opposing forces on June 26th. Interesting. Okay. Now, so um, is, is, am I remembering this correctly, that uh, some of the Comanches were chasing Bell himself out of town? Yes. Now, it's it's... It's difficult to say how closely the, uh, you know, White's battalion is to uh, Bell's men when they ride out of town. Right, okay. Um, one thing is interesting. When Bell comes down York Street, uh, we're going to talk about this in a moment, he urges his men to disperse, and if they want to go home, that they can. And a couple guys on the York Road at Rock Creek— uh, we're talking about near, I always use Beer Mart as a, I can't use Beer Mart anymore. It's gone. Yeah. Um, but right there at the um, uh, the bridge. The, right. The, like the, where the, the, what is that now? Like a rent a center? The rent a, yeah. Is it, what, is it a print shop now? Yeah, Gettysburg Print. And Gettysburg, Gettysburg, okay. The, uh, okay. But right there, a couple of the guys leave the column and ride down along Rock Creek, including a guy named Leitner, mm -hmm. who lives uh, in southern Adams County, and a guy named Sando. That's where they leave the column and ride along Rock Creek south. 
Oh. They don't turn at the square on Baltimore Street and right up Baltimore, Baltimore Street. Street. They go out to Rock Creek and ride out along Rock Creek to get back to their homes. Interesting. But we'll and, talk about that okay, in a Okay, okay, okay. So um, let's go to the next map. Put my hand right up there and just shut me down. <laughs> That's right. We <laughs> so can't talk about that yet? Not yet. I, so I have a plan. <laughs> White's men, the 35th Virginia Battalion of Cavalry, Stop outside the town. Okay. And um, I think it's a Lieutenant Strickland's account, and they talk about what they're going to do, and they would like to make a bold entrance to the town. So they, they, they come up with a little plan. They're going to ride into town. They're going to shoot their, mus- their, their rifles in the air. And so they come riding down Chambersburg Street into the square and ride around the square in a circle and fire their pistols in the air. And it scares the citizens to death. Sure. And it's a show, a little show of force. Um, there's a couple of accounts by kids, like Gates Fonestock, who said it reminded him of a, a Wild West show at the circus. Right, right. And um, uh, of course, he of says that in later town. in yeah, his life he says it because later, Wild so. West shows aren't a thing yet. Yeah, he, yeah. he thought it was very humorous yeah. <laughs> that, that they were all putting on a big show. Um, uh, but the Southern Army rides into the town; they capture the town. And this is an 1863 photograph of uh, Chambersburg Street from the square. And uh, there's a little uh, photograph of Elijah White um, off to the left there. So that um, the, the, the house, the brick house that we're looking at there is where the bank is today. That's right. And, and at the time of the battle was George Arnold's store and Farmers and Mechanics Bank. George oh, so, Arnold was oh, okay. a banker. So that was a bank. Yes. And so they, it's um, ACNB Bank. Not, today it is. Yeah, not yeah, to be Adams confused County. with Adams County National Bank. They're the ACNB Bank. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the B stands for bank. Bank. <laughs> they don't like that when I talk about that with them. <laughs> They're nice people. So um, this is Baltimore Street from an 1863 photograph, and there's John L. Schick's store, John Lawrence Schick. Okay. Not to be confused with Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. Schick. Schick. Yeah. And you can see the courthouse there in the distance. Um, and then the next slide we have is uh, William T. King. Is that the one you have up, Eric? Yep. William T. King was part of Robert Bell's Adams County Cavalry. And a bunch oh, of the men yes. in that unit, we're talking about 40 guys, are from Gettysburg. There's a guy who lives on York Street, and he rides by his wife and children as he's fleeing through the town. Mm-hmm. William King lives on York Street, and something had happened to his leg. Um, maybe he was um, suffering a little bit uh, from an I- injury on one of the rides, and he was at his house when the other members of the cavalry came riding by, and his wife said, <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. I'm sure they can see that. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, King goes running off the porch, jumps on his horse, and rides out of town with the rest of the men. And again, when these men ride through the town, they're yeah. leaving their wives and children in the town that's about to be overrun by the Southerners. And as we all know, the Southerners eat babies. <laughs> <laughs> I like that from Chambersburg. Good account. <laughs> So to go to the next slide, William T. King has a tailor shop in the center of the town. Yeah, this is a cool picture. Now, we don't know when this has occurred, but William T. King's granddaughter gave this sign. Oh, wait a minute. I'm wrong. William T. King's daughter Hmm. gave this sign to the Adams County Historical Society. William King's daughter. And it's got two bullet holes in it. Yeah. Three. Three? Where's the third? Four. down at the bottom there. Four. Four? Where's the fourth? Oh, oh, it's a small one there. Okay. Like a little pistol so, shot. So they were not fans of William T. King. No, I guess not. <laughs> and we're not exactly sure what to, you know where the sign hung, but he had a tailor shop in George Arnold's store. So we probably think it was probably in the middle, of the, the center of the town, on the square, on the side of George Arnold's building. So now, now wait, is, is he he's re, is he related to Sarah King? Yes, yeah, Sarah Sarah Barrett King is his wife. It's his wife. Yes. Now, is in the, there's a story about her wanting to see the kids uh, as they're chasing Bell past uh, their house, or it, it might. It, and she tells them to and, hide. No, and I think he, either he or her father 
It, would that make sense? Her father would be there, and he would be saying, "Get those kids inside." Yeah. She says, "No, I want them to see yeah. history." Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, and so, now her her house is a Chinese buffet. That's right. It's it's at the site of what is now Lee's Buffet. That's yes. where William T. King lived. Yes. Um, recently, at the Adams County Historical Society, uh, one of our volunteers was going through the William T. King letters. We have no. letters that. William T. King's wife writes to him while he's in the army and vice versa. Right. And um, there was this one page letter front and back that had been slipped into between some other letters. And it was written by William T. King's 10 year old daughter. And it looked like it was written on like July 5th or 6th, 1863. And it says, you know, Dad, we are hoping you come back soon. There are Confederate soldiers around the house. We have Confederate wounded in our house. There was a guy here yesterday trying to get me to help him locate the body of his son. Hmm. All kinds of stuff hmm. like this. Really neat letter hmm. from right after the battle. So the story is William T. King's daughter, Mary, marries William McLean's son. William Archibald McLean, who becomes the editor of the Gettysburg Compiler. Oh. And he prints his mother-in-law's reminiscence of the battle, Okay, Sarah Barrett King. Oh, all right. So, so that's how all that happens. He marries one of the kids that she keeps out on the porch to witness history. Yeah. Interesting. Yes. Okay. Good. It's been a while since I read that account. I remember she takes her family flees the town during the battle, ends up at the maybe the Reinhardt house on the East Cavalry Field. Okay. <laughs> and stays there during the fighting and then comes back into town. And it's so a really she, good account. Uh, and remember also that her father, John Barrett, is the constable of the town that John Burns detests. detests. Oh, oh yeah, you John were saying Burns that on the Burns. Rival. Yes, okay. Let's go to the next Interesting. one. Interesting. Now we have, uh, is it a picture of George Washington Sando and his wife, Diane? Mm -hmm. So uh -huh. Sando and another of his comrades, Leitner, uh, who lived in Southern Adams County, not to be confused with Nathaniel Leitner, who lives around the Baltimore Pike. A lot of people confuse that. Mm -hmm. They left the column at Rock Creek on the York Road and rode down Rock Creek. I don't know if there's a path all the way for horses, but there's a, a lane that goes along the side of Rock Creek for much of the distance from the Baltimore Pike. Hmm. But they um, ride to the Baltimore Pike. And the story is... And, uh, of course, told somewhat by um, James McAllister of McAllister's Mail that as the troops are coming to the Baltimore Pike and hopping over the fence, um, White's Comanches come riding out of town down the Baltimore Pike. Okay. When White's guys get to the center of the town, he orders his men to ride on the different arteries and chase whatever columns they can find. And these guys are going down the Baltimore Pike. You might know that they pass through the Baltimore Pike um, Tilly Pierce. Oh, we're going to talk about that in a moment. Yeah. But they chase Sam Wade, Jenny Wade's sister, um, down uh, taking Jenny Wade's brother, brother. Yeah. taking uh -huh. uh, horses out of the town. They capture him around Evergreen Cemetery. They fire at people in Evergreen Cemetery that are fleeing the Confederate advance. But some of them keep going to the, down the pike. And as luck would have it, a detachment of Confederates is riding down the pike as Sando and Leitner are coming up onto the bottom of pike out of the area of uh, Culp's Hill. And there's a brief exchange of fire. And George Washington Sando is killed, a member of Robert Bell's Adams County Cavalry, the first Union soldier to be killed in Adams County during the Gettysburg Campaign. And Diane is a widow. And Diane's a widow, and she has a cocked pension. So, so Sando, uh, see, I always pictured it that Sando was chased I know. down, but yeah. he actually skirted the whole area and thought he was getting away. And, yeah. Oh, poor guy. Yeah. yeah. So that's, so that's interesting. Okay. I didn't realize that they went out uh, on basically 30 East yeah. and then cut down yeah, on Rock around. Creek. Now, you said there was a there's a road or a path that goes yeah, along it, Rock Creek? Is it, can 18, you still find it? Yeah. When 1867, um, there's, a, uh, photo, there's photographs taken along Rock Creek. Uh -huh. And um, I don't know if they took one of the well-established paths or they just, there's maybe another path along the creek, but... Um, 
the Tyson brothers, I should say C.J. Tyson and probably William Tipton and his uh, associate um, uh, Myers took photographs, Peter Myers, along uh, Rock Creek. And one of them shows people swimming in Rock Creek. And we know there's kind of a path that leads up to the area of the swimming halls. So, hmm. um I, you know, I don't know exactly because you you think of it as really rough area to be yeah. riding a horse all the way along Rock Creek. Right. I mean, but, in Rock Creek maybe, but yeah. But, but they, I mean, it was different back then. And it was deeper too. Yeah. By all counts. It's oh, deeper. really? Remember, it's raining too. And oh yeah. So it's up. The dam is keeps the water backed up. Mm-hmm. So the next slide is Tilly Pierce, and many of the civilians wrote accounts of the battle and virtually all the booklets on the battle also mention things that happened on June 26th. And in 1888, Tilly Pierce Allman recorded her reminiscence at Gettysburg or what a girl saw and heard of the battle. Or the and, girl who saw everything. Yeah, And she has an interesting account on June 26th. And I'm, I'm sure for people who have heard my discussions on her before, I know Veronica has, I'm using that very complimentary towards uh, Tilly Pierce. <laughs> I think I do it for two reasons. One is everybody thinks that we're going to think that Tilly Pierce is a heroine. Because she wrote about it. Right, right. You know, I mean, so she wrote about it. Yeah. <laughs> Not everybody who writes an account as a heroine. But, um, <laughs> but Tim, she, she helped the wounded. Yeah, she helped the wounded. She did. So um, I kind of look at her as a spoiled little brat. Yeah, she kind of does sound like a spoiled little brat. And she, but she's writing this years yeah. and years later, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, 25 years later. So it's one of the it's actually one of the earlier accounts as opposed to some of the later accounts. OK. But, you know, also, number two, she bad mouths Jenny Wade in her right. book. And that's really and that's what not going to sit well with no, me. You're yeah. a big fan of Jenny Wade. Yeah. And so um, and then the whole episode with her and Jenny Wade's brother just bothers me. The whole thing just bothers me. Now, why does that bother you? Now, tell the tell everybody the episode and why does it bother you? OK, so. I think um, off the top of my head, uh, you could look in the exact date. I think Sam Wade is 13. I'm thinking he's 13. I believe so. And um, uh, Sam Wade works for Tilly Pierce's family. Uh, James Pierce is a butcher. He works his fingers to the bone so his daughter Tilly can go to the finest finishing school in the area. <laughs> So, um, Which is whose school? Mrs. Eister's? Mr. Eister's. Yeah, Mrs. Oh, Eister's Miss, okay. uh, Academy. And... Um, uh, so on June 26, Tilly is upset because the Confederates are coming to town and her pet horse may be captured. Oh. So the father sends Sam Wade with the family's horses to try to get out of town. Of course, it's too late. The Southern Army over overrun the town. And so they send this young boy with the horses riding out of town. Meanwhile, Jenny is at her sister Georgia's house because Georgia is giving birth to a child that day. Right. The family has things to do. Right around the time that uh, they're all coming through town, right correct? Right around the time, yeah. yeah. She, according to the best account we have, I think um, the child's born about 3 p.m. and this is all happening about 3.30. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe around 3 o'clock? Sure. So anyway, the uh, Confederates come over the hill and they chase Sam Wade up the hill, Cemetery Hill, and they fire pistols at him and order him to halt. And then they capture Sam Wade and they take him as a prisoner and take him back into the center of the town. And Jenny comes running out of the house and she sees the Confederate cavalry who've just been firing their pistols at her brother, taking him up the street. And, you know, she chases him up the street and then um, there's Tilly Pierce and her mother sitting outside and of course Tilly's really upset now because Sam the idiot <laughs> allowed the family pet to be captured <laughs> right that moron and yeah. so Jenny just looks over at him and says hey what are you thinking yeah you know you put my so I think she says in if, danger. if something happens to Sam I don't know what I'll do with you folks or something like that yeah, I think I would have done something and she gives too. a little bit of uh, right. yeah, a little, little sass there <laughs> she's little like something snap. happens to Sam I don't know what I'll do with you folks and then and then Tilly Pierce goes on her book to say this is all done because Tilly her sympathies are not where they should have been right you know inferring that she's some kind of southern sympathizer jenny, jenny not Tilly. jenny jenny's, oh. jenny's sympathies aren't where they yeah, should have been jenny's yeah. sympathies shouldn't yeah, and a poor dead girl 
yeah. been dead 25 some odd years. You tell him yeah. the story and, you know, leave her alone. Let her rest in peace. Yeah. I'm and with then, you. And then the other thing <clears throat> about it is, you know, Jenny has a boyfriend in the Union Army. Jenny was working on her brother's uniform when word came that the rebel cavalry were approaching Gettysburg, and he was one of the one. Her brother is one of the ones that fled out of town with Robert Bell to get away just before this whole incident occurred. She's right. trying to help her mother, you know, deliver her, you know, nephew. She's got her hands full at the house, and now she and has she's to planning go. her bread recipe for That's the next right. couple days. She's, she's getting her bread ready. <laughs> And then she has to go back up to her, her sister George's house, where mm-hmm. Georgia has just given birth to an infant, tell her mother, hey, they've taken Sam prisoner, and we have to go up to the you know, square and hope we can get him back. And they go up to the square, and they get him back. And then Tilly infers that while, that while Jenny and her mother are getting him back, that they're telling, you know, the— uh, Elijah White, everything they can about the right. union families in town. Right. And then somebody comes to her house and says, we hear you have a brother in the Union Army. Well, Jenny has a brother in the Union Army, too. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's just a whole thing. I feel bad for Jenny just, because— It just upsets me. You know, they weren't uh, uh, well off, right? They were—would um, you say they were poor or yeah, just— they, they were poor. They were poor. Yeah. And uh, you know how people talk. And I, I'm guessing people—you know, she probably—people talked about her anyway. I know we know Jack Skelly's mom was talking about her to Jenny. Jack That's and right. all these rumors and everything. And the poor girl's sister is uh, giving birth. She's doing her brother's uniform and her mom's helping with the kid being born. And then the brother gets kidnapped and then take it back. And she she has to deal with all this crap. And then to top it all off, she's only like three days away from getting killed. Well, That's a right. week away. Yeah. Now she yeah. doesn't know that at the time. No, she doesn't, but we do. Now, <laughs> Georgia... Her boyfriend, or I should say her husband, is also in the Army. Yeah. So, um, uh, Tilly Pierce, though, having said all that, it's one of the best books written by a civilian about their experiences during the battle. So, having said that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> having said so. Yeah. Okay. So, then so we all have, that uh, Tilly bashing, yeah, Sarah, and now yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, all the Tilly bashing is done. Okay. So, um, right, good. then we have the next slide is Sarah Broadhead, who, of course, recorded her reminiscence of uh, the battle in a... Um, uh, a diary afterwards, and there's lots of quotes. I, I'm sure I could find one by her, but no. she no. describes the Confederate enters the town on June 26, and also the Confederates playing Dixie in the town mm. square. So let's go to the next one. Did Sarah, you go Sarah looks to me like a depressed yeah. person. She's very here, depressed. Here's Baltimore Street in 1888. Okay. Very nice. And then, oh, I have Sally Meyer Stort, so who also... Wait, those of you watching at home, the blue and gray is on the left. Is that the same building? That they just modified? Yes. It is. Yes. So it is the, the blue same and gray building. Bar and grills on the left. Do you know, uh, I have not been back to the blue and gray since, you know, the COVID, COVID restrictions yeah. ended. And I that means I have not had a general mead <laughs> yeah. in like a year and a half. I know. I usually get and the for John Buford. For the uh, listeners who don't know what we're talking about, they have hamburgers that have something to do with military figures in the battle. Yeah. The General Meade is a hamburger with a cheesesteak sub on top. Mm, it's oh, delicious. Yeah. I just fantastic. had one like last week too. It was yeah. phenomenal. It, they're, they're so good. And then I, I get the one that I think it's though. the I think it's the Hancock or the Buford. It's Hancock like a blue cheese. With avocado. No, then it's the Buford. I think okay. it's got like blue cheese. And oh my god! And it just drips all over the place. It's fantastic. And the, the Long Street has but, peanut butter. Oh on yes, it. yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm glad we can Well, let's go there after there. this. Yeah, let's all go to the Blue and Gray Barn Grill. <laughs> but yeah, do you see also when you're, since we're talking about it, that building has not changed that much? No. No. no nor has the other one, uh, the uh, uh, on the right, House of Bender the, the or whatever that is. House of Time, it's called now. House of yeah. Time. It used to be called the House of Bender, and at the time of the battle was J.L. Schick's store. Schick. John Lawrence Schick smoked 21 cigars on the first day of the battle, his personal record. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of stuff he wrote in his account. <laughs> I'm sure he was stressed. <laughs> so Sally Meyer Stort, let's let's go to the next one. Sally Meyer Stort. She also um, has a diary uh, uh, around the time of the battle, and you can read her reminiscences of the incidents that occurred here and in this um, in the fight. There are a good amount of civilian recollections of June 26th. Let's go to the next one. So. 
Juber Early rode to Mummersburg. Now, remember, three of his brigades came through Mummersburg. Right. The Louisiana Tigers actually marched down the Mummersburg Road, and uh, a lot of people don't realize this, camped in the area of the Peace Light on the evening of June 26. But the other two brigades, Hoax Brigade and Smith's Brigade, camped back at Mummersburg. And um, uh, we'll, we'll save that. I have a one account I want to read from that. We'll save that. But Juba Early, when he, once he learned Gettysburg was captured by first White's Comanches and then Gordon's men moved into Gettysburg, he came down into the town himself and he requisitioned the town uh, supplies from the town. And this is an interesting story. Here's a sketch. And it's Juba Early in front of a pump. And you can see it's raining, mm. and there's some guys with an umbrella there, and he's on his horse, and he's writing a demand for supplies. Mm. When mm. I was a kid, the big book that everyone had was the American Heritage Centennial History oh, yeah. of the American Civil War yeah. by Bruce Catton. And this sketch appears in that book as Juber Early writing a requisition at Hagerstown. Oh. It's a Charles Reed oh. sketch. From the Library of Congress. I went to the Library of Congress. A friend of mine wrote a book about Charles Reed, Eric Campbell. Okay. I don't know if you've had Eric. Eric uh, is a ranger in the Shenandoah Valley now. I, in my personal opinion, the best interpretive ranger I have ever met. Really? He's just incredible. Okay. He is very good, yeah. I remember him being here. Eric was writing a book on Charles Reed. He pulled his papers, and I was at the Library of Congress, probably researching, as Gary Edelman would say, some stupid civilian crap. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and uh, I think I was going through the Edward McPherson papers or the Fatty Stevens papers at the Library of Congress. And uh, I remember the one thing I remember is Eric turned over the box, and there was something jing- dingling, jingling around in it. Right. And... Charles Reed's Medal of Honor fell out of the box. Oh wow! Like it was in the it was box just like with somewhere to the papers oh, just wow. laying there. But um, he was going through the sketches, and he did a book on Charles Reed. You can see his book; it's really good. And he's a member of the Ninth Massachusetts Battery at Gettysburg. And this sketch came. You know, he turned over in the sketch, and on it, as big as day, it said Gettysburg. <laughs> and I realized that. For whatever reason, they had incorrectly used this sketch in uh, Centennial History of the Civil War. And this is Juber Early writing out his demand on June 26th in front of the pump. And, and it matches the account we have exactly. And the account is what? So let's go to the next one. So Juber Early rides into the town. He rides up. He rides up. Oh, I'm falling down now. Oh, Jesus. We got to get a new stool. <laughs> he he rides up Sorry. to the water pump. His horse is drinking out of the trough. And, okay. uh, and he sits there on his horse and he writes a demand for supplies. And he asks for bacon and flour and hats and 500 pairs of shoes or in lieu of $10,000 in cash. And we know, according to the account, that he's sitting in front of Moses McLean's house when he writes out the requisition, and there is the pump. There is another sketch at the Library of Congress, which I did not, at the time I saw it, you weren't allowed to, nobody had a cell phone, right? and you weren't allowed to make Xerox copies of these sketches. But there was another sketch of the pump that showed Moses McLean's door behind it. And clearly, it was that pump and that door. And Moses McLean lives right there in the third house from the square in this view. So that's on uh, Baltimore Street. It's, it's, Baltimore it's Street. like, what, two doors down from the uh, from the house of, that's what right. is it called now? Time? House of Time. Yes. And um, it's now um, uh, the Christmas house. Oh, okay. That's the Christmas house, the White House. Yeah, all right. So there you go. Well, no, no. Well, the, the bread brick house is the Christmas house. And then beside it is the cigar shop. The cigar shop, yeah. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Here's an 1888 view of uh, Baltimore Street uh, looking down the same uh, stretch. Oh, I'm messing up here. Yeah, the Fawn Stock House looks like uh, they got those extra floors on by yeah, that point. Yeah, they, right? they added some extra stores, not to the Fawn Stock House, 
But I think that extra story, that's um, that's where the Woolworths was for a while. Oh. And they tore it down. And now there's some other modern buildings there. But that's right next to the alley. Let's go to the next one. And I think I have John Burns coming up. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. So according there to uh, John Burns, uh, Juba Early writes the requisition and gives it to John Burns. And John Burns takes the requisition. He wants to find the mayor, but the mayor of Gettysburg, Robert Martin, has fled with his horses, the Burgess. So um, it's kind of like the Burgermeister, <laughs> you know, the Burgess. Yeah. So the president of the town council is David Kendall Hart. Mm-hmm. And John Burns takes the re- demand for supplies to David Kendall Hart. And David Kendall Hart writes a letter. And the letter, you know, we have a copy of, and it says basically, you know, that we knew you were coming. We sent all the supplies out of town. The bank has sent our money out. We don't have any money. We don't have any supplies. We'll open up the shop doors and you can look in and you can see we're telling the truth, but we just don't have any, we can't meet your demands. Right. So uh, then John Burns takes the message back to Juba Early. And according to Juba Early, according to um, David Kendall Hart, Juba Early reads the letter, gives it back to John Burns. John Burns gives the original letter back to David Kendall Hart. So David Kendall Hart ends up with the actual note written by Juba Early and the letter he wrote in reply. And then he saves them as souvenirs of the day. So this story of Early being in front of Kendall Hart's house. Uh, Moses McLean's house. No, no, no. Oh, oh, oh I'm there, sorry. there's a version yeah. that Early's in front of Kendall Hart's house, reading off the list of demands, and his daughter supposedly took this all down. But is that malarkey? Probably not. Yes, probably. Okay. It, it, Where does that come from? Um, I think that's uh, that comes from the Kendall Hart's. I think so it's they probably, said that. I think it, they're probably telling the story. And they're just excluding John Burns's role. Yeah. And they're just saying, no. <laughs> okay, yeah. well, poor John. you know. Yeah. There's, and it's not only that, there's like four versions of this. Yes. Like the town council gets together and meets right. in the square at, I think, Stevenson's law office, which is where the pub is. Okay. And there's a whole account by members there that they talk about what they should do. And they tell Kendall Hart to write the letter. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's several different versions of what happened. And it may be... Like, uh, all these things may have a little shred of, of, truth, of yeah. truth in them. Ladies like, and gentlemen, though, in the audience, isn't it cool when you're sitting here and eating at the pub or at the Blue and Gray? You know, you look at these things, you're thinking of restaurants and everything, but all of this stuff played out right in and around those buildings. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So um, here, let's go to the next one. And here is, because I mentioned that the family kept them tipped in, shot a photograph of the requisition for supplies in the 1880s or 90s. And here is, do you have the requisition of supplies up? You can see it says like 60 pounds, or is that 60 barrels of flour? 7,000 pounds of bacon, I think. Yeah. Uh, 1,200 barrels of flour. I don't know what the top one is. Your guess is as good as mine. Looks like Jude. Yeah, 600 pounds of coffee, you know, um, 10,000 pounds of salt. And I think, believe it or not, I think it's 40 barrels of sauerkraut. At least that's what one interpretation is. You know, we have these people that say what the message says, but I got to tell you, I'm having trouble reading it. (laughs) Yeah. A thousand pairs of shoes, 500 hats. Well, that makes sense. So yes, for shoes. And on the back of it, it says or in lieu of $10,000 in cash. So what is the top one? I forget. I, I, I'm trying to remember. <laughs> it look, to me, it looks like 60, Jude or Juice. 60-something of something. 60? 60-something 60 of something. Okay. So oh, the story gonna, is, gonna now let's me. go to the next one. So we have, I have a picture of David Kendall Hart, and then the letter he wrote in reply. This letter was eventually sold by the family in a local relic shop, and someone bought it who ended up donating it to the uh, Gettysburg Foundation, who gave it to the Gettysburg National Military Park. And currently, uh, we are, well, let's say we're hoping that they lend it to us on 
uh, a temporary loan to the Adams County Historical Society for our new museum when it opens up, the original demand. Oh, cool. It's never been really displayed. Nice. Now, let's go to the next one. I have a picture of a guy standing on Baltimore Street. This is interesting. This is uh, Joel B. Danner, who ran a museum in the 1880s and 90s. People would come to town uh, into the early 1900s, and he had a museum filled with relics that were associated with the battle. And he, here's a photograph of Danner in front of the Fauna Stock House, and the square is back behind us. Mm. And that's actually a pump that that is, you see where the people's yeah. drugstore, that's a pump. And that is a trough which they're dump, pumping water into. Now, we know that's not the right pump. We know that the pump is farther up the street near the square. But mm -hmm. can you see, I circled here, the requisition of supplies, and the note that Juba Early wrote is on that display, and he had it in his museum. Obviously, he just brought it out for this photograph and hung it on the pump. Right. But that trough in that photograph is... In 1910, it was given to the Jenny Wade House Museum as part of their relic display. Yeah. And just recently, um, I made a sort of a deal with uh, Max Felty to mm -hmm. actually have that put on display at the Adams County Historical Society's new museum. Oh, that'd be cool. The trough that supposedly Jubal Early's horse drank out of when he wrote the requisition for supplies. Nice. So it still exists. That's pretty neat. And now let's go to the next one. No, wait, wait, hold on. Go, go back to that one go here. Ahead. I just want to point something out to uh, the people watching. So you know, like Gettysburg is a historic town, right? And so they wanted to have a historic look. And one of the things is uh, I had a, a friend who used to make signs here in Gettysburg, and he was always going, you know, head to head with uh, the borough over sign ordinance and their whole historic district look and everything like uh. that. Look at the signs <laughs> there. If, if we were actually going to make this look historic in this town, we would have that mess of signs. So I, I don't know. I think maybe there's like, cause like, look, like that one sign comes out over, it needs a pole to hold it up on the other end. You see that? Yeah. Well, they, they, you know, they weren't as careful as they could have been. Yeah. Could have been. I look, I like on the other side uh, of, uh, if you look to the right of Joel B. Danner uh -huh. uh, at 21 Baltimore street, which is just on this side of the blue and gray bar and grill, mm -hmm. there's a large pocket watch. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, Penrose yeah. Myers Jewelry Store. Yeah. Look at the size. That thing's got to be huge. If you, from that <laughs> distance, it's that big. I always wondered with the giant pocket watch if it keeps time. That would be awesome. Yeah. If it did, I doubt it. Okay, let's go to the next one. <laughs> so now we have a close-up I made from the original negative of that photograph. And you can see that that's the actual... Uh, demand for supplies and above it, or above is the demand for supplies in the letter that Kendall Hart wrote in return. Oh, wow. Look at that. <laughs> and then I, I don't know if you have that one, Eric, but I, the next one, I just compared the two. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. So you can see it's the same thing yeah. in that photograph. Yeah. So that is the actual um, written reply. Huh. Now, the next slide is the courthouse. And I put that in because I was going to tell the story I already told it, where Juba Early comes riding up to the courthouse, and according to Clement Evans, who was in uh, the provost marshal in the town on June 26, I guess he's the colonel of uh, Eric. Do you do you remember the 38th Georgia? I, I'm a little lax on my Georgia oh, brigade yeah. knowledge. Maybe it's the 26th Georgia. That's Boy. a Georgia unit. Boy, okay, wait a minute. Let me. Oh, it's the 31st. Georgia. But I was right. The 26th Georgia and the 38th Georgia are in that brigade, but he's the colonel of the 31st Georgia. I'm sorry. That's okay. I do have a cheat sheet here. Yeah. Do you know there was a time I knew all the colonels? Well, you get all oh, yes, I remember that. Ugh. Well, I don't remember that, but I remember you told me that. <laughs> well, that's good enough. I, I didn't have to actually do it. I just needed to tell people that. <laughs> I think I know two colonels, <laughs> so... So um, let's go to, to the go. next slide. And one of the interesting things uh, is that Juba Early gets the reply for, you know, the town saying they can't make his requisition. Mm -hmm. And um, he uh, he's a little upset. But just at that moment, a writer comes up and says, hey, there are 3,000 rations on a train sitting at the end of the track here at the edge of town. <laughs> From the, the rations 26. for the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency <laughs> Regiment that they brought with them on the train. 
And so Juba Early rides down, and he's very happy. Yes, I'm sure. So he's gotten something, and he's going to be nice to Gettysburg? He's going to spare them totally? or Yeah, well, you know, he never did say that he was going to do anything if they didn't make their reply. Right. But that, and, uh, but that's implied, isn't it? It's implied yeah. or else. A bunch of armed men show up now, and say, give me let, this. Let me remind you that two days later, uh, you know, the Confederates enter York. And while he's in York, he makes a demand for supplies. He mm. has for $100,000. And the town of York pays him $28,000. Close. And then they come back to Gettysburg, and Juba Early's division is buying things from the townspeople. Oh, yeah, right. And they're using that money from York, and they're buying all kinds of stuff. Ah. And so, you know, it's kind of a joke in the years after the Civil War between Gettysburg and York that Gettysburg didn't pay and nothing happened. Right. And York, you know, spent, spent. the $28,000. York kind of just, like, rolled over and showed its yeah. belly, though. Yeah. They gave it. Yeah. We, we had yeah. Scott Mason to talk about that okay. on Patreon and... Uh, well, New Granville York, York, O'Hower tisk, made tisk. a big speech and wanted him to put up a fight. Yeah, and they didn't. Uh, clearly, he's not an inspiring man. <laughs> because it didn't work on the Yorkians. He was bored in York. Oh, and he was trying. Yeah. yeah. yeah they, they, well, clearly, he wasn't popular when he was living there. <laughs> but here's an image of the railroad. Do you got the next image up, Eric, with the railroad? So here's an image from the railroad tracks looking across the bridge that we just talked about on Route 30. We'd look, be looking across Kane K Tire to Culp's Hill in the distance. We're looking down Rock Creek. Wow. Okay. So that's the bridge. I mean, not the same one, obviously, but that's Route 30 now. And so, man, there were no trees in this area no, anywhere. So they destroy the railroad bridge, not the car bridge, but the railroad bridge one, they destroy it. Right. And then they somehow push the cars down the track from the center of town that are on the track and dump them into the creek off of the destroyed bridge okay. and create a huge mess. Mm. And they light some of the cars on fire and they do a lot of damage. Gordon's brigade spends the night in Gettysburg. Let's go to the next one. So they do some destroying, but not of people's homes or businesses or anything like yeah. that. So um, next, uh, we have um, Mummersburg and um, three, uh, I mentioned uh, three brigades march through Mummersburg. The Louisiana Tigers spend the night uh, somewhere near um, the Peace Light. But, uh, let's see if I can find my letter. I know I just saw it in here. Uh, the other two brigades camp around Mummersburg that night. And we do have a civilian letter that's really interesting in the Adams County Historical Society that talks about uh, the Confederates camping around Mummersburg that night. Let's see if I can... What did I do with it? This... Um so, okay. so you're talking about the rest of the division that's up in Mummersburg now, right? Yeah. Okay. So Juber Early rides back to Mummersburg, and Juber Early spends the night in downtown Mummersburg. And we actually know, uh, I have a letter, um, what house he spends the night in. Uh, let's see. Juber Early spent the night at the postmaster's house, um, Samuel Hart where they were entertained by the family. <laughs> Hart was probably most accommodating, I say. His son, William, who was a lad at the time, remembered that the next morning, as he was preparing to depart, the general offered his father $10 Confederate bill for the night's entertainment. <laughs> Mr. Hart replied that he had no change and would prefer greenbacks. But General Early was without the latter. <laughs> so... But there's a great account that we have. We have a letter written on June 20 or July 29th, 1863, from a guy named G.F. Minter, who lives in uh, Mummersburg. Uh, Every place you might look, you could see some rebels everywhere. Some places, everything is destroyed. But what they had on at George Lauer's, and let's see, is George Lauer on this particular map? I think he's, um, mm -hmm. um, he's going to talk about John Throne here. At George Lauer's, which is north of this, 
They took the horses in the house and fed them out of the bureau drawers. And they took and broke up everything in the place. They encamped, he says, the first ones, meaning on June 26, encamped in John Thrones Woods, about a quarter of a mile from us. See John Thrones' house there on the map? Oh, yeah, okay. So they camped in that area. And the guy down there, I think his name is Abraham Van Dyke. Okay. He's got a massive claims file for damages. And, of course, that is along the Hilltown Road. Does he get damages? Does uh, he get uh, his... Nobody's going to get damages. Of course not. No, of course not. No, just... But anyway, uh, two Confederate <laughs> brigades camped in Mummersburg, um, Mummersburg, on the evening of June 27th. So Mummersburg and Gettysburg are both visited by a brigade of early di- or brigades of early division. Um, of course, the- let me point out, Gordon's brigade, to the best of our knowledge, camps at what would later become the site of Camp Letterman. Oh, so, so they're up, they're out on Route Thirty. They're at the Giant on Route okay. Thirty, basically. So so they're not occupying this, except for the band playing in the except square. Except for uh, you know uh, a few of the men who are in, inside the town, yeah. Clement Evans and whatever men he keeps in the town. The whole brigade, the you know, it's like two thousand men camp mm-hmm. outside the town. Okay, well that was nice. So let's go to the next map. It's my troop movements the next day. So they stay the night here, and the next day. Um, you see, they move across to Adams County in three columns. Mm-hmm. And that's why, that's one of the reasons I said I think Juba Early would have divided his force anyway. Right. He wants to move across Adams and York County by parallel routes to get to the Susquehanna River. Mm-hmm. And you can see that on this map, uh, I have uh, the Louisiana Tigers march up to Mummersburg, back to Mummersburg, and then they march out across. Um, uh, Goldenville Road to Hunterstown, and then march up what is now 394 through uh, New Chester and out through Hampton and um, East Berlin and into uh, York County. At the very bottom of the map, uh, um, uh, Colonel Elijah White would leave Gettysburg, ride out to Hanover Road, and uh, eventually go to Hanover and then ride to Hanover Junction. Mm. And the center column... Uh, uh, John B. Gordon's brigade um, would actually march out of Gettysburg, and I have some little things here. They destroyed the railroad bridge, probably mostly the night before. Then they rode out, and they destroyed uh, Golden Station, which is a warehouse along the railroad. They burned it to the ground. They tried to get into it and get the supplies out of it, and the people claimed they didn't have the key, so they couldn't open it up. So the guy with the key laughed, so you can't get in. So they just burned it. <laughs> Makes sense. And then they marched to New Oxford, and they destroyed the railroad bridge across Conewaga Creek about a mile northwest of New Oxford. And if you ever want to do something fascinating, go to New Oxford train station and walk the tracks northeast out to that bridge. It's like 50 feet in the air above the creek, uh, and it's a massive bridge they destroyed. Really? And Herman helped Mm -hmm. rebuild the bridges that the Confederates destroyed after the battle. And so Gordon's brigade marches through New Oxford and then Abbottstown and into York County, where that night he reaches uh, farmers. And that's when the right. representatives from York come out and surrender yes. the city to him. I, I, I uh, encourage you guys to uh, become patrons because we talk about this with Scott Mingus. He wrote a book about it. And uh, shame on York. Shame on York. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, of course... Uh, and then I have another map. The next map is uh, on June 27th and uh, 28th, uh, the Confederate Army captures York, Pennsylvania, and uh, Gordon's brigade goes all the way to uh, the Susquehanna River at Wrightsville. And uh, at the same time, you know, Rhodes Division captures Carlisle, and part of Albert Jenkins' brigade uh, skirmishes on the outskirts of Harrisburg. And... Um, hmm. Uh, the last slide I think I have on here is um, the burning of the Wrightsville Columbia Bridge on June 28th. And so uh, this 
June 26 action that we talk about is part of a larger campaign where the Confederate Army moves across York and Adams County and advances to the Susquehanna River. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know while the Wrightsville Columbia Bridge is in flames, a spy has arrived at Lee's headquarters yes. and is telling him that the Union Army is now at Frederick, Maryland. Yes. And Lee is going to order for the concentration of the Southern Army back at Gettysburg. So, so all right? progress is halted and they all head on back. And, and they're all going to have to turn and head back. The Battle of Gettysburg begins. Yeah. Um, okay. Now, so, go ahead. I was going to say, there's probably a few questions that we well, yeah. didn't so answer. That we here's have. what I'm going to do, Tim, because we are on uh, hour four of the show. So <laughs> what, I'm, <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you the question. We're going to do it like a lightning round, okay? okay. All right. So here we go. Uh, quickest answers that we can come up with here. Rich, I'm sorry, Rick Fish from San Antonio wants to know, were there any Gettysburg Confederate collaborators during the June 26th visit, beside, of course, Jenny Wade, uh, were any freed black Gettysburg residents seized? and sent south to slavery on June 26th. Go. Well, I would say no to the first one, but at the head of Jeb Store's column is a guy named Jim Furley who had formerly lived in Gettysburg but had moved to Virginia. And he was a Confederate scout that led the column. And there's a great account where on June 26th, um, he leaves the column and then... Uh, uh, finds his former employee, I believe, Adam Dorsum, a blacksmith, and beats him up. Oh, it's not nice. Yeah. And uh, to the second one, you know, at the very outbreak of the campaign, uh, Albert Jenkins guys are gathering up uh, African Americans and right. marching them back down in the South in captivity. And a lot of the people in this area have learned of that, and a large amount of the black population has fled. And I don't know if anybody taken on June 26 per se, but you know, during around the time of the battle, the Southerners are actively scouring the area and trying to. Uh, capture any black citizens they can find. Well, Tilly Pierce talks about, I, I don't know if it's on the 26th, yeah, but she talks about yeah. them fleeing to Culp's Hill. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, so who is it that... Uh, Sally Myers talks about them fleeing. Yeah, but also uh, somebody uh, somebody's mother oh, hides them in above oh, the kitchen. Yeah, that's um, Mary Warren Foshnot. That's right. Hides the family. And then uh, who's the boy that witnesses... Uh, Albertus uh, McCreary says he sees black citizens being taken prisoner during the actual battle. And one of the, he quotes one of the guys saying, goodbye, we're going back into yeah. slavery. Yeah. Um, but and so I, there were smaller, it wasn't as widespread as west of here because no, we had because, some warning yeah, here. Yeah, had some warning. Yeah. So west of here, it was really bad. Yeah. In Chambersburg on June 15th and June 16th and June 17th, that's when the real gathering is taking place where they're just gathering up dozens, if not hundreds of... Uh, uh, black residents. There's a there's an account from a woman out in Chambersburg. I can't remember her name now, but she talks about how they are chasing them down and rounding them up like cattle, like we would drive cattle. She yeah. says, it's really uh, sad. Um, okay, uh, William Richardson, Bill Richardson wants to know. I read somewhere that Gordon had sent word back to Ewell of a shoe factory in Gettysburg. Any truth to that? Well, that's a that's a that's um an interesting story. So, and there is a that story's been around for a while. As far as I know, that is an old guide story, meaning uh, it was probably started. Uh, there's no real good source to where it started, but the tour guide started telling the story early on. Hmm. Wilbur Nye, the Civil the War Civil guy, War guy. <laughs> in his book, Here Come the Rebels, he writes that in his book. He uh -huh. says that when Juba Early was in town— he was kind of busy. He noticed there was a shoe factory, and he didn't have time to go over to the shoe factory and check it out. But he had time to send a message back to A.P. Hill and say, hey, if you come through the town later, you should probably check out this shoe factory. Yeah. So a couple things ridiculous about it. He's got time to write a message to tell this guy, but he doesn't have time to send an aide over to see if they actually have shoes <laughs> at the shoe factory. Good point. And then the second thing is, what's Juba Early doing with AP, his QR commanders, Yule. Yule. I bet you every message goes to Yule, and then goes to Lee, and then you don't. He's not going to be sending a message to AP Hill or right. Heath. That's ridiculous. And he he he, I mean, he would know that Hill yeah. is behind him, right? So I want everybody to get out their copy of Wilbur and I, the Civil War guy. Sure. Here come the rebels, and I want you to find this passage we're talking about in the book. And, and there's a out. footnote, and I remember. 
that in the guide room, I do this a lot. When somebody asks about it, I pull it out and I'm like, look, here's a footnote. And I'll read what he says in the note about him sending a message back. And there's a footnote. And we turn to the footnote. And the footnote says something like, on June 30th, Henry Heath came to Gettysburg to check out this shoe factory, but ran into Buford's Cavalry and turned around. And then the next day, which he says in the book is June 31st, <laughs> comes into town to, you know, and I'm like, what? June 31st? June 31st? Well, anyway, it's a... Well, back then they had a 31st a, day. In other words, the footnote that he has yeah. associated with this, there is no footnote. Okay. It's an annotation. I got gotcha. you. And that's, I, I, you wouldn't believe how many times I catch authors doing this, saying something dramatic and then having a footnote. And then most casualties are like, oh, wow, it must be documented. Now you look and see what the footnote is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's always interesting to read the footnotes. Like we were talking about the other day with the Lieutenant Colonel Crest thing. Yeah. The footnotes gave me no help at all. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, Skip Wankman asks, did Governor Curtin or any authority really think that the 26 PEV or other militia unit would make a true difference against Lee's veterans? We, we touched on this before, yeah. but if, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, well, I feel bad, you know, picking on them or criticizing them because sure. I understand exactly the situation they're placed yeah, in. it's a tough and, situation. Uh, and um, to just expect that these troops are going to be able to stop Lee's veterans. Let me put it this way. At no point at any time during the Gettysburg campaign did any militiamen stop Confederate advances. Right, right. And as a matter of fact, not only did they not even come close to stopping any Confederate advances, they ran every single time, <laughs> quickly. Right. They so might. it really is no contest <laughs> at all. They didn't even slow them because no. they, they sped, they up sped them up. Yeah. So Brian Derenick says, uh, is there any record of an attempt by Gettysburg town leaders to contact mil military officials in the Army of the Potomac to alert them that a portion of Lee's army had moved through yeah. town on June 26th? Well, like, I, like, like we talked about, um, the townspeople, David McConaughey, David Wells, are both at the telegraph office of sending messages to Governor Curtin. Mm -hmm. And then they expect Governor Curtin will relay that information with a vast amount of other useless information <laughs> to the Union High right. Command. <laughs> but then, you know, they don't know the Army of the Potomac is in close proximity until it reaches Emmitsburg right. on uh, June 29th. Yeah. But on June 28th, Copeland's force rides into Gettysburg and David McConaughey talks to Copeland. And at that point, the Union Army's in Frederick and that, you know, and is still under the command of Hooker. But then, you know, he'll end up relaying that information to Meade as the Union Army advances. And he has another question. Uh, you know, big stars on the 26th is White's Comanches, or are White's Comanches. Uh, mm -hmm. But what, did, what role do they play in the rest of the battle? Well, they're, um, they're at the head of, um, uh, you know, June 26th when they come into town. And June 27th, they ride into Hanover. They ride through the center Hanover. They go over to Hanover Junction. They cut the telegraph wires at um, uh, uh, Hanover Junction. Mm -hmm. And maybe Scott Mengus talked about that. And uh, we even have a great account, you know, from one of, uh, I don't remember the exact time, but to give the exact time, like at 12.07 p.m., the telegraph line was cut somewhere between Glen Rock and, you know, York. Uh -huh. And then they ride to uh, Spring Grove, and, uh, which I think they call Spring Forge maybe at that time. Okay. But they end up spending the night at uh, Spring Grove, and then they come back across Route 30, and then they end up riding to Heidlersburg, and then moving into Gettysburg with uh, Juba Early's force. Um, it's interesting that when the Southern Army portions of it, and I guess White's guys would be part of that, come through Abbottstown on their way back, they hear firing in the distance about six miles away to the south at Hanover, and you're wondering, aren't you looking for Jeb Stuart? <laughs> Can't you right, like, right. figure out that that's Jeb Stuart there? You know, they're, they're not paying much attention. No. Oh, okay, go ahead. And so they, they go back through um, to Hunter, uh, up by way of New Chester. I think they come into Hydersburg. And then the next morning on July 1st, uh, Albert Jenkins' guys are, are with uh, Juba Early's guys when they come into town. And Albert Jenkins is wounded in um, the Battle of Gettysburg by a long-range artillery shell and ends up um, uh, 
Yeah, is that where Jenkins? Yeah. Ends up uh, on, the, I think it's on early morning hours of July 2nd, he's wounded. Ends up on the Harrisburg Road in a hospital. And he's killed in 1864. One interesting story on the evening of July 1st, Albert Jenkins is at the meeting with Robert E. Lee and Robert Rhodes and General Yule and Juba Early mm. when they're at the Spangler House mm -hmm. and they're discussing the situation as to whether the Confederates should attack Culp's Hill on July 2nd. So we have him there at that meeting, too. Okay. So he's doing something. He's pretty active. Yeah. He had his, uh, his beard was really long and he tucked it in his pants. Is that right? Is that who I'm thinking of? I don't know. No. Okay. He's got a long beard. Yeah. All right. Well, Tim, thank you very much for this. Eric, you did a great job with uh, the slides and everything. Yeah. And I think the audience uh, will give you a round of applause. I'll do it on their behalf. Um, but yeah, thank you for, uh, for doing that. Thank you, Tim, for coming and putting all this stuff together. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching and thank you all for listening. Lots of thanks to go around, but we hope you enjoyed this and we will talk to you next time. Don't forget, in order to send those questions in, you got to become a patron. You got to become a patron. And we just got a patron in the middle of the show here, so uh, welcome Ben Roca. I think you, it's Roca. How do you know that? Is it like, I, uh -huh. I get a notification. It's oh. Roca, R-O-C-C-A or Roca, I don't know, but Benjamin, welcome. Thank you. Uh, okay, that's it. Good night. Thank you, Tim. Need a core badge or other insignia for your uniform? Then check out the badge maker. Here's what some of his satisfied customers had to say. Miranda said, I ordered an identification disc from Joe and it's fantastic. He hand stamped it exactly as I wanted. Greg said, my unit has purchased from him in the past quality badges and good service. And Jerry S. says, the badge maker is the go-to place for accurate replica Civil War badges. So go to CivilWarCoreBadges.com and attach a message with your order saying you heard about him on Addressing Gettysburg. Our hearts so stout have got us fame For soon tis known from whence we came Wherever we go they dread the name Of Gary Owen in glory Instead it's fall, we'll drink down there And pay the reckoning on the nail No man forget shall go to jail From Gary Owen in glory Instead of fall, we'll drink down there And pay the reckoning on the nail No man forget shall go to jail From Gary Owen in glory